Craig Conway. With the right foot. Oh, and it's in again. They've got a second. And Sean Rooney has scored once again for St Johnston. They've got one foot in the Betfred Cup final now. St Johnston seizing their opportunity. Ah, what a goal that was. Welcome back. It's episode eight of Dogger Saints, an unofficial St Johnston podcast. Alan Preston talks Darren Dodd's diabetes, dog food and drinking. We talk about how Shunrar, East Fife and Queen of the South are netting St Silverware. And we also take a wee trip to Denmark, the Royal, East End Park, the Haberdashery and 1990s McDermott Park. All that and more. episode eight it's the dogger saints unofficial saint johnson podcast and i am here as always with heartthrob dream maker danny williams how you doing sam good to be back it's dan and sam's workout plan and you'll be the envy of all your friends <laughs> yeah i've managed to not catch any body parts and zips this week so i'm uh, fairly chuffed with that it's gone better for you than last week then hasn't it it wasn't too difficult but here we go sit back relax we'll take it from here you auditioning for a part on smooth fm with that intro now he said I've ripped it completely off Johnny Vaughan and Radio X. That's his opening gambit. But I liked it, so we're going with it. We'll be lots it. We're playing Lee for Vandross for the rest of the episode after that. <laughs> That's something for the ladies. But anyway, we've got no match this week to review. That's our usually our opening our opening period. So we're just gonna sit in silence for the next five, six minutes and you can fill your own time. Get the, get I'm the knackered on. for the rest of the episode. The only I've come to realise as we've been doing these that sort of one of my main jobs is being boring about football. I, I, I may as well just go. I'm, oh, I'd say I go down the pub, but I can't. I'll just go and sit down and watch the telly. You just do that. But we do have a feature to fill it. We're calling this bit of corrections, clarifications, and follow ups. We're eight episodes in now, Dan, and we admit to ourselves that we're not always right from time to time. We don't always get everything spot on. We're frequently wrong. That's that's probably the most straightforward way to put it. We, we're usually pretty inaccurate with most of our stats. So going back to episode one, we talked about Madis Vyman and our Doggers on Saints section, and I said this. Doggers on Saints? We'll put this in the corrections section next week. <laughs> Can't even pronounce the name of our own features, right? Doggers on Tour. And I came out with... <laughs> Madis Vyman, we salute you and your uh, haddy ways. It had all the potential there. Six foot five, big defender, international... I don't even know how we scouted them. Or it must have been one of these guys that got picked up on Ultimate Teams or on FIFA or Championship Manager. Look at this boy. So we got a, a message in from somebody a couple of weeks back and I've been meaning to bring this up. He basically states how Maddis Vyman joined the club in the first place. Do you know this, Dan, or how? Well, I assumed it was Football Manager, but given its corrections and clarifications, and it's also assumed that was wrong. It was. Um, the guy pretending to be George Weah's cousin actually called St. Johnson. And so. <laughs> No, he played for Estonia against Northern Ireland. Tommy Wright was there, thought he was an outstanding centre-back, and he got signed on the basis of that. So there we go. Well, it turns out even Tommy was flawed. <laughs> he might have had one good game, or Maddis. Northern Ireland had a 45-year-old David Healy playing up front, or someone worse than a 45-year-old David Healy. There you go. But that is how he came to play with Saints, not through football manager, championship manager. He was actually spotted by the, the main man himself, Kilmarnock manager Tommy Wright, seen him in action. So that covers that one. We want to do a wee follow-up as well. We've asked a couple of players over the piece, uh, their favourite dinosaur. Now, Important journalism. Oh, pff, it's, a, it's a hot topic on the Dogger Saints podcast. I might have made a mistake because Kevin Rutkovic said that T-Rex was his favourite dinosaur. I agreed and said it was. Oh, T-Rex. Uh, that's, that's the only right answer, to be fair. Anything else is incorrect. <laughs> yeah, I changed my answer, didn't I? I was getting a bit excited about dinosaur chat. I originally said Velociraptor. Kieran McInesby actually pointed this out to me. He's more on the ball than you think. Can't remember names, but can remember, <laughs> um, can remember mistakes regarding dinosaurs. It's a, it's a unique party piece from the man. But while we were chatting, I asked him his favourite dinosaur. He also went Velociraptor. It's a solid choice. And did you agree with Kieran then? I did. I, I agree with everybody. I, th I think there's only two... Two proper choices, really, isn't there, when it comes to dinos? Yeah, really. I mean, I'm T-Rex loyal, but there you go. If you, you can have more than one favourite. He then went on to say that uh, Velociraptors are agile and very efficient in battle. 
It's, it's two good traits for a dinosaur. Sounds like he's eyeing up signing some sort of velociraptor to play on the wing. <laughs> That's it. It's a bold strategy. I won't want to. I won't want to watch. I want to want to play at fullback against a velociraptor. <laughs> It's a, it's a very valid point. And we'll finish up the corrections, clarifications and follow-up section with a text I got from my, my big brother, Kevin, who uh, was listening last week and had a little story about Ainsley Harriet, as you're well aware, hawking his branded couscous in the Leeds megastore. For reasons entirely unknown. Absolutely no idea whatsoever. He lives in Chester, he's an Arsenal fan and he's selling couscous in Leeds. Uh, he's a renaissance man, is Ainsley. So why, why should we expect anything less from him? He's got his fingers in many pies and his hands rubbing lots of meat. <laughs> Give his meat a good old rub. <laughs> That's even creepy when you say it. What? That was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I had to see you do it. You even did the hand actions. So, my brother's in a pub quiz in Chester and he walks in with his girlfriend and Ains- <laughs> Danny's now lost it. You all right there, sir? Yeah, fine, fine. Good, I'm back. Good. Back. Continue about <laughs> the, um, the elder of the Miller brothers. That's it. So Miller Senior, he's in a, he goes into a, a, the Faulkner Hotel in Chester for a pub quiz and he spots Ainsley Harriet in a team of six. He thinks, well, this is a good pub quiz. I think I'll take part. They finished in fourth Ainsley Harriet's team. There's six of them. Honestly, I mean, for one, what's the quiz master doing? It's four at a maximum, mate. But, Let's have this right. <laughs> yeah. Just because, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a celebrity, it, it shouldn't change anything. No. How many, was in, how many was in Kev's team? Him and his missus, just the two of them. They can make it if they try. And guess what? They won it. They only went and won it. They only went and bloody won it. And do you know what their team was called? Well, can't quiz, won't quiz. <laughs> it's funny because Ainsley used to do a show called Can't Cook, Won't Cook. <laughs> that is exactly the point, Dan. And uh, apparently Ainsley wasn't too too chipper about that either. But there you go. He seems like such a jovial character. He does. He does. But he doesn't like the piss being ripped out of him in pub quizzes in Chester. But there we go. There's another fun fact for us. But that brings our odd feature corrections, clarifications and follow ups to a close. So from shit chefs to shit pitches, Paul McGinn of Hibs came out this week and said the McDermott surface was disgusting. Yeah, I don't know where he's getting that from. It looked a perfectly fine pitch to my eye. I mean, it, obviously it's different and things can be deceiving uh, to the eye. And when you're playing on a pitch, it might feel a little bit different. But I mean, come on, mate, you just I forgot he was on the pitch, to be perfectly honest with you. So... It, they were a bit rubbish. They lost to a better team. It just, I think it's a pretty transparent excuse. And from what I've seen, in all fairness, even the Hibs fans were like, what are you going on about, mate? Yeah, I've got two points to bring out of this. The first one is, has he seen his own pitch? <laughs> the state of that place. Easter Road pitch, he cannot be complaining about anybody's grass when there isn't any on the Hibs pitch. It's rank rotten. No, it's, a, it's a spud field. <laughs> and secondly, the use of the word disgusting. I can't hear that word ever in my whole life till the end of time without thinking about this. And don't forget all this trouble we got into. Why does somebody not know how to flush a toilet after they've had a shit? What do you mean? Well, I was f***ing one of yes. Disgusting! Absolute classic. It was one of yes. <laughs> Paul McGinn thought the St. Johnson pitch was disgusting. And that's a year to the day, uh, roughly this week, since St. Johnson played their last home game at McDermott, which is sad for a couple of reasons. One, it's been a year since we've been at McDermott. And two... Gary Holt came out and said the exact same thing about the McDermott pitch when they lost 1-0 at McDermott. Yeah, but to be fair, they play on a plastic pitch. It's the same every week. And oh, I don't know. I got I got riled by that at the time. I'm not dipping back into it. But yeah, don't. apparently this weekend in March every year does something funny at a McDermott pitch. I don't know. I don't think there's anything it wrong with it. probably doesn't. No, the ball seemed to travel well on it because I kept to be out in it. It didn't look great in the telly, but that was on a podcast with a Levy fan. And he was saying, well, this is my argument for the, these plastic pitches. Even at the rubbish level I played at, because as we've discussed, there's one way you can boot the ball in the Dundee Airport car park in a huff, <laughs> which are the grass pitches. But there's like, a, down there, there's 3G pitch as well. It's fine, because you know you're going to get a game on. But even at that level, you're sort of gutted yeah. when you find out you're on a free... 3G pitch instead of the grass or 4G or whatever it is now. It must be on about know, 8 or 9G. Mobile phone signals. Yeah, that's it. As soon as it gets to 5G, that's when that's when COVID's going to come back again when the pitch is... <laughs> that's when Bill Gates is entering your brain, man. <laughs> that's it. He's controlling Wake up. <laughs> so McGinn's just talking pish. Can we can we move on? Yeah, let's move on. Let's and, he, and his brother's just been punted on loan, so maybe he's upset about that. Would you like a story, Dan? Have I heard it before? You may have heard it last week when we forgot to include it on the podcast. So when I'm telling the story, you have to act like you've never heard it before. Well, it's a goodie, so I look forward to hearing it again. So I'll offer my apologies because I sent him the link saying, oh, you'll have to listen, your story gets a mention. And he's like, where? Where is it? Ah, uh, forgot. So to my friend Scott McCaskill, here's your story. 
So this goes back, Dan, to Saints were in the first division. We were having a day out in Dunfermline. Not many places you can go. The Elizabethan is a great boozer, but we were in Legends, which is their equivalent of the Muirton Suite. We were in there before the game. It's for Dunfermline season ticket holders, but we managed to sneak in because one of the guys we were with was a Dunfermline fan. So we were in there pre-match. Bluttered. Simple as that. We were in there from 12. I think we left at about 5 to 3 when we basically got kicked out. So we were well oiled. We all leave out the front door to walk around to the away end. Scott has to go in for a for a piss. So he goes through a pair of double doors. The steward says, well, you'll have to go out and round. He, he said, he can't hold it. He has to go. So the steward said, right, nip in there very quickly, but get out afterwards. So he goes to the toilet, comes out. The steward's gone. He's like, oh. But he's still got a saint scarf on, so he pockets it, walks through another set of double doors, and he finds himself in the main stand, and he plonks himself down next to a couple of scouts. Brilliant. <laughs> That's how you do it. If you look like you should be there, that's how you should do it. So he's sitting there and you notice that everybody else has got notepads around him. So he, he pulls out his phone and starts pretending to type notes because he's panicking at this point. So the scout next to him kind of realizes he's absolutely at it. Absolutely at it. But invites him in anyway because he seems like a nice guy. So the scout invites him in at half time for the sandwiches and the tea and bits and pieces. And he's back out in the stand and he gets chatting to two other women who were scouts and did believe him that he was actually a scout, which is odd turning up to a game of football with as a scout with no notepad and steaming drunk. So, but they believed it. And he said, long story short, I was in this suite afterwards drinking champagne with a bunch of scouts for the club. So brilliant. That's, a, that's what you missed last week. So if you ever want to get into a game, dress, dress a wee bit nice, bring a notepad and don't be drunk. But it's, it generally seems like it doesn't matter. I don't bear them. Do what you want. I'm a big fan of the fact that he said he left his, um, his pen and paper in his car, despite <laughs> yeah. the fact he was absolutely battered. I, th- I think that might have been the point where the other guy realised that he wasn't a scout. Yeah, absolutely hammered it. I've left my notepad in the car. This is one job to take notes. But I remember, I remember I'm waving to him from the... It was a game where we won, I think it was 2-0 or 2-1. Liam Craig scored an absolute peach from about 30 yards. And um, he's waving to us from the, the way end, which he managed to save himself like 19 quid by not having to pay to get in. So we were all a little bit pissed off at that. But there we go. That's our, that's our story. It was well worth the wait. He didn't get the atmosphere, though, did he? That's that's what he was. That's what you got to keep telling yourself. He got the champagne and sandwiches and whatnot and cups of tea. He, no one, Scott, he would take that every single time. Yeah, so would I. <laughs> so that was Scott's story. So have you ever taken a wrong turn getting a pie and ended up being on the bench at McDermott or first team coach at Montrose? You let us know. That actually reminds me, before I go, actually, a quick story. My brother-in-law, William, was on the coaching role at Steny, like coaching the community, and a player from Brecon turned up, wondering where the rest of the team was, and he told them it was a home game for them. So he'd driven to Stenhouse Muir, and he's like, no, no, you're actually playing at home. So he had to then drive to Brecon. <laughs> that's, that's Scottish football at its finest, I feel. So, Dan, let's take a seat on the couch. That sounds comfy. Would you like a cold beer? I'd love a cold beer, Sam. There you go, my friend. Uh, how about we move this up to the bedroom? We can't because we've got a Twitter poll to do. <laughs> Dan's looking at me wondering where the hell I was going with that. I think he still is. Well, that, was very, that was improvised. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think we'll go down that avenue again, but still, we do have a Twitter poll to talk about. And this week we discussed, what was your favourite game from 1990s McDermott? A good poll. A good poll indeed, and we had some good options. So the options we presented to you was clinching Europe versus Dundee in 1999. Good game, Paul Kane header. We had the 7-2 against the same opponents in 1997. Chick Charlie sent off for head biting Robbie Rayside. A 5-0 horsing of Aberdeen. Get it right up them. I think that was 1991. 1990, yeah, September 90. Yep. We'd only been up a couple of months. Yeah, 1991 was what I was getting at. And... The option that amongst our sort of sounding group, we were, you know, this was the big favourite. This was Roddy Grant scoring versus Airdrie in what has been described as the greatest game of football ever played in 1990. Pivotal to promotion. Maybe ever. So the results are in from Twitter, Stan. We must point out this is from Twitter. This is from Twitter. So with 11% of the vote propping up the table... It's the five no horsing of the Dons. It was in fine. It was in fine company, to be fair. But a great result. A great result. Newly yeah. promoted team beating a massive Aberdeen squad five 0 at McDermott. Were Aberdeen cup holders at that time as well. I think they were. Yeah, I think that was the season. The uh, just off the back of the season where they beat Celtic on penalties. I think it was like twenty four, twenty three on penalties. They won. Yeah, the never ending penalty shootout. <laughs> That's it. What was third in the table, Dan? Third in the table, Sam, was the Airdrie game. 
Oh, no way. Boah, 21% of the vote. Wow. But we'll come on to that in a minute. Okay. With 23% of the vote, in second place was the 7-2 against Dundee. Probably my favourite. That was why I voted for it, just because it was a, a great day. First, in 1990, I was seven, so I didn't really have the same level of footballing like days out than I did later on. So, again, I was 14 in 1987, but I was with my whole family. My grand and granddad were there, my dad, my mum, my brother were all there on that January 1st, and it was a stupendous result. Loved it, every minute of it. Having a rare old time. Oh. A young Sam Miller having a rare old time. I think I think he, even, I think he even got a watered-down Bacardi Breezer when I got home. There we go. What a, what an event for you. <laughs> and given the photograph in the paper of you prior to the cup final when you were 16 and you looked about five, <laughs> I'd imagine that would look like a newborn Ben drinking that. <laughs> what a damn Bacardi Breezer. I like a Bacardi Breezer. What happened to them? I don't know. I don't know. Used, that was back to some days in the student union, that. Orange Reefs. They were good. Yes. Reefs, good. Smirnoff Ice, Bacardi Breezers. But then you got stuff like Smirnoff Mules and other... All your yeah. VKs, they just got... Sorry, we've, we've kind of gone off-piste a bit there, Dan. Yeah, the one that... <laughs> you just get hooch and then that ends up making a comeback. Nice. I think you can still get hooch, I think. Yeah. Yeah, hooch. Not that I drink alka pops because I'm a 31-year-old man. <laughs> anyway, anyway, sorry. <laughs> back to the point. <laughs> sorry to uh, distract away from the, the, the Twitter poll. What was, what was number one? With a resounding 45% of the vote, it was Paul Kane's goal to clinch... A European qualification against Dundee in 1999. A packed house in McDermott. Probably the biggest crowd I've ever seen at McDermott. I think there was more people outside on the bank in. Lasted memories of that game would probably be the club doctor going absolutely mental. I'm sure Alan Preston will have stuff to talk about that as well later on when we've got him on. But yeah, first time in Europe in a lifetime against Dundee. Alan Main pulled off an absolute wonder save against James Grady. Yeah. He'd tend to get the last laugh uh, a few a few years later. <laughs> he did, but yeah, that I mean that was an unbelievable save. Yeah, up there. With... He, he he pulled off a few of them that season. Were just outrageous. Yeah, uh, but what a great game! It wasn't a great game at all. It was nervy. It was horrible. But a packed house and a worthy winner, I would say. But looking at our Facebook, we posted the same thing on Facebook, and you would have said that Airdrie would have been the resounding victory. We might as well have only posted one option on Facebook because, you know, in the comments and everything, it was just Airdrie. Everyone was Airdrie. So maybe there's a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a generational thing there. But I mean, they're only, uh, only eight years apart, nine years apart. Yeah. So I don't know. And I'm not saying like it's all older people that use Facebook, but maybe you get a, a bit of an old, I don't know. I, I don't really know, actually. It's uh, a strange, and as I say, it's only nine years, but. Our Bebo poll said that it was a 4-0 victory against Third Lanark in uh, 1924 <laughs> that I should have won it. <laughs> Freaking Bebo. But we are a podcast for all ages, and please, if, you are, if you're aggrieved by that result, get yourself onto Twitter for our weekly poll. Keep an eye out. We'll post when we're going to be doing one, and you can make sure your, your favourite event, player, chocolate bar that the club has sold, favourite tea lady, whoever it is, whatever the Twitter poll is, that you can be a part of it. Now, Dan, my favourite feature. It's time for shit merch. But well, we are renaming shit merch. We are. We're, we're, we're a family-friendly podcast, and we don't like saying things like shit and f***. So we're going to call this new section the Club Shop of Shame. Yeah, the Club Shop of Shame. Do not say fuck or bugger. <laughs> no. That is an old reference now. <laughs> it is an old reference. If you remember Bo Selector from back in the day, you will get that reference. But yeah, we're, we're, we don't need to say swear words just to, for a bit of smut for, for no reason. So we're, we're not. We're, we're moving on. We're bigger than that, Dan. We're bigger than that. And Are we? Nah, absolutely not. Customers of St. Johnson this weekend have finally been getting their League Cup winners t-shirt sent through. So we're spending a little bit of time on Dan. It's the world of fashion. Oh, uh oh As David Bowie was sung about, fashion. <laughs> to the left, to the right. Fashion. Right. <laughs> fashion. Um, so... Yeah, again, Saints have done quite well on this front of late with the cut winners t-shirts and obviously before that, all the cut final clothing and the replica tops. So, and this is, you know, let's not mess about here. Saints are fairly, in the grand scheme of world football, St. Johnson are the biggest club. We know that. We all accept that. A provincial club. Yes, you could say that. But some of the bigger clubs in the world, in the grander scheme of world football, also dabble in the world of fashion. We've... Quite frankly, horrifying results. 
So the first one we're going to go to here is we're going to go to Old Trafford and go to Manchester United. And obviously these big clubs in world football are big global fan bases. It's absolutely understandable that they want to cater to those fan bases. So one of the big events in the world every year is Chinese New Year. So Manchester United decided to do some profiteering on the back of that. (laughs) Uh, And there was a range of stuff, but the highlight of which was a Manchester United Chinese New Year jersey. This wasn't just some T-shirt saying happy Chinese New Year or whatever. No, this was like an American football jersey with dragons all over it. It is horrendous. I'll send you it free. We'll put it on the socials yeah, after not, this. I've not seen this yet. Go on, go on just get your peepers on it, mate. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. That I'll, we'll, we'll post it up, but I'm looking at a, a, a model who looks frankly disgusted to be sporting this piece of tat. And it's got, like, you see these tattoos of, like, the, the big snaky dragon type thing. It's covered in that. And it's, it's, and it's 64 quid. 64 quid to look like a total tit. Oh, man, that's terrible. This is it. It's, it just proves that no matter how big you are and no matter what price tag you put on it, because this is no different to the Bolton Wanderers tape measure, in my opinion, in terms of complete tap. <laughs> you're, you're slagging off your beloved Man United here. I only, uh, I only have one loyalty on this podcast, Samuel, and that's St. Johnston. Of course, of course, yes. My bad. Uh, no football interest whatsoever. Um, as anyone who follows me on Twitter will know, it might be the second worst bit of clothing I have ever seen in any capacity, not just through football, in any capacity, which leads us nicely on to the worst bit of clothing I've ever seen. And Sam, I'm just going to send you this through, but as I do, while you get it, I'm just going to explain to uh, the listeners that this is... Obviously, you know, you, you're going for a night on the tiles. You go, oh, you know, I'm going to put a shirt on here, particularly in the post-COVID world. <laughs> oh, my God. World. Oh, my God. I've we'll just seen it. Get a bit, we'll want to get tarted up a little bit. I've just seen it. So if you're a Liverpool football club supporter, you can wear a short sleeve shirt, <laughs> button-down shirt, uh, with a panoramic view of Anfield on it. It's not It's not even centred. No, it's, it's not even centred, Sam. You've got, it's obviously taken, I think mean, this is a case of an old iron enemy that I know in this much depth. It's taken from the cop end, looking out at the Anfield Road end. And so the goal behind the cop end is completely sort of to one side of the shirt. You'd think they would have put it central. And then you've got, uh, you've got the other stand, I think it's the main stand, just creeping into the corner. That's so bad. I actually want to see the back because I want to know if it's a wraparound <laughs> and you get all four stands on there. Oh, well. Or three of the stands. That, that would change things. It, it would make it worse. It'd make it even more worse. <laughs> but the shirt itself, the white buttons that go down the front don't add anything to it either. No. <laughs> Nothing adds it. it. The style of the shirt, for people that can't see it, is like, remember those old emo shirts from early 2000s that had the flames and that going up it? Like a, yeah. da- like a dart shirt. That is what I'm looking at with a, it looks damn near bloody picture of Anfield. Yeah, you do always have... So- the best of it is, this hasn't come from the same place, the flame shirts that some kid had always turn up with on non-uniform day with a pair of baggy jeans with a chain hanging on. Listen to some 41. It's not come from the same place wherever they've come from. It's genuinely, this is genuine official merchandise. Oh, and God. it is dreadful. It, it's really bad. It is awful. But that's pretty terrible in terms of fashion. Now, I don't have anything fashion-based for you this week. It. Who would wear it, man? I'm sorry, I can't get over it. I'll just, I'll just think on that quietly, and you can get on with what you were going to get on with before I interrupted by thinking out loud. Not at all. I was just going to say I don't have any fashion items for you this week, but I do have. Well, there's another team in Scotland this week releasing champions merch. This is Glasgow Rangers who won the league this week. Congratulations to them. <clears throat> and yeah, yeah, and um, glad for them. Yeah. So. Well, St. Johnson released whiskey this week. Champions whiskey, 500 bottles, a nice memento. It's not something you would drink because we've seen before that you could buy it for 14 99 the bottle, but it's not something you would drink. You would keep it, you put it on display, put it in the cupboard. It's a nice memento, a collectible from the day. Now, yeah, yeah well, Rangers have done the same thing, kind of. They've released a special product. It's a small one, but unfortunately this one, it, it doesn't keep so well. It's... It's a Champions Edition bar of Cadbury's dairy milk, but not even a big one, just a regular size. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, what a memento that is, something that melts or yeah. goes off. But the reason is you wouldn't eat it because it costs seven quid. It's, <laughs> I mean, anything that's in this section is there for naked profiteering. <laughs> let, let's not mess about. And we, un, we all understand the point of that. 
up in the for reference, I got a bar of the same chocolate, well, nearly the same chocolate as whole nut, right? <laughs> from from the supermarket for last night for a quid. Where this extra six quid has come from? So in fact, the extra six pound ten because it was seven pound ten for some reason. Yeah, because uh, it says fifty five on it. Oh wow! There you go. That um, yeah, that <laughs> that makes it all that makes it all the better, doesn't it? My 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 hind soup says fifty seven on it, so I'm not getting charged. <laughs> not getting charged eight quid for that. But the worst thing about this whole thing, Dan, is I clicked onto it to see if it was still available, and it was put in a queue for eighteen minutes. This thing must have been selling like. Chocolate. You know what I'm. <laughs> you know what I'm getting. The image I'm getting in my head is them all arriving, broken or melted or something, and it'll be like the girl who constantly goes into the beads, <laughs> complain about the chocolate. <laughs> I'm just imagining that. So yeah, anyone who's well, Rain putting it on sale is a bit shameless to start with. Anyone actually queuing for about for more than quarter of an hour, anyone queuing at all to get it, anyone buying it at all, but queuing for. A, 18 minutes i mean but it doesn't keep it doesn't keep no they're just gonna eat it and i, I, don't, I don't know it is absolutely baffling but each to their own as we always say this is it so we've covered well, what the fuck are you doing so coventry city they are the never-ending pot of brilliance for us we're not going down the car care route this week dan we've exhausted all them options what? yeah why we're, not because we're moving into the pet market Oh, here we go. So you're sitting at home with your cat. Your cat's awfully hungry, but it's bulls. I'm allergic dirt. to cats, so I don't like this analogy. I'm not a fan of cats either, to be fair, but I don't like them, so I would definitely make them eat food out of a Coventry City cat bowl. <laughs> they are the never-ending well of patter. They are <laughs> unstoppable. I mean, this week I was maybe hoping for, I don't know, you know them furry... Fairy things you could put around the steering wheel. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was hoping for one of them with like CCFC. Brilliant. All the way around it. Maybe, maybe they already have that. Maybe it'll come up in a future week. But the move into the cat market. Cat market? Is that even a thing? I move into the pet goods market. <laughs> there's also it's, a, there's also a, a lead, a branded lead. There's also a branded lead. Yeah, yeah. Like a dog Getting lead. one for Buster. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I don't think it could have been. I've, I've just missed out. It could have been a Mother's Day present for, you know, a Manchester United support. <laughs> no, I've already blew all my money on a, a Coventry City electrocution dog collar. <laughs> they, I don't even know what to say. No, they, they don't make them. You never know. It could be coming up. It, it could be. Coventry City, get your thinking caps on gear and make us some terrible products. I mean, just imagine. You've. Again, it comes back to it's the ice scraper argument from last week. You know, I've had I've had dogs all my life, right? And I saw no much a bowl cost. I'm assuming it's less than what Cov is selling them. I assume it's the same for cats for a start. And I assume it's also a damn sight less than what Cov is the cat really gonna appreciate it? Who's gonna I mean, see- this is the this is the big thing. Who's gonna see it other than the cat? Cats are snooty bastards at the best of times, like <laughs> They're gonna turn the no- they're well gonna turn the nose up at a very mediocre football club from the Midlands. <laughs> I don't think they'll be impressed at that. But it no. could it could be another one of these these things where you have a guest round and going, oh, that cat supports Coventry City. Oof, I might give myself some of that. <laughs> there we go. Maybe a neighbouring cat sort of sneaks in through cat flap. <laughs> He's like, oh, we're onto the good stuff here. <laughs> this is the high life. So that was our trip into the club shop of shame. Over to you, Dan. So. Picture the scene. It's a big night out on the town in the metropolis that is cowed and beef. Have you? And you're, you're getting ready. You want a pair of matching his and hers towels. And then for after you're ready, you want a matching pair of his and hers winkle pickers and stilettos, <laughs> all branded by cowed and beef football club. <laughs> a right good night on the town in cowed and beef. Have you seen it? You let us know. All the usual channels. Get there. <laughs> Have you, have you ever been out in Cowden Beef? <laughs> no. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> so over the weeks, Dan, we've been very lucky to have some massive ex-St. Johnson players on. Nick Dazovich, Michael Jubilee, Kieran McInnesby, Richie Foster, Chris Miller. The list goes on and on. We've been very, very fortunate for the guys we've got on. We've got on another absolute superstar of the club. Yeah, really looking forward to this one, actually, Sam. Uh, this man done a few podcasts recently in in great form so hopefully we get the same for our, our listeners 
Yeah, he's most remembered from the club for scoring an absolute screamer in the League Cup semi-final against Hearts at Easter Road back in 1998. He doesn't hold back about his love for the club and his career with St. Johnson. We can't really say much more other than to welcome on Alan Preston. Afternoon, gents. There you are. How you doing? You all right? Yeah, how you doing? Not bad. I'll just change the name from my missus's name to mine. <laughs> I was about to say, who's Angela joining us? I'm using uh, our iPad, mine's just running out. Perfect. How are you, all right? Very well, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. No problem, no problem. Try to fill your days. <laughs> I'm quite busy, back golfing, which is great. I had a knee operation in the uh, first week in December to get my knee cleaned. Um, so it's great, back golfing, which is brilliant, and good news today, I can play in four balls, so I'll start to get out even more next week. So it'll be good fun. I've seen a number of your uh, podcasts, so it's been good. It is, yeah. We've been very fortunate to have on the, the guests we have had on. Um, it's been great, but you've been one of the very fortunate people, shall I say, that who's managed to be at both Saints Cup finals. Um, you're at the League Cup final. How was that for you? I know you're a work, there in a working capacity, but it must have been a good day out. It was great. It was great to be there. Uh, very fortunate. I am always feel very fortunate working with the BBC at this time because you're getting into games when fans can't get in, you know, and, and it's a real shame. And it's not the same without supporters. But I was glad that I got given the game by the BBC, obviously, with my connections with both clubs. And it was just great to be there, you know, to see Saints win it and thoroughly deserve to win it as well. It was a great occasion. And then I see everything after it when the TV cameras are switched off, like Stuart, Stuart Cosgrove stealing a billboard as a, as a souvenir. <laughs> Um, and things like that so uh, you see all that you know which is great to see yeah it was uh, one of the uh, Stuart Cosgrove was on with my pal Stephen Watt and I managed to get one of the Betfred hoardings as well he dropped it off the other day at my house so I don't know what I'm going to do with it I wanted to put uh, it up in my few. I, I wanted to put it up in my living I room but... had, I, think, I, I think he's had a few pints as well <laughs> as well to be honest um, and rightly so I mean, there's no many that have been to all the, the League Cup uh, finals that St Johnson have been to there's no many people I no. think Stuart might be one Jeff Brown's probably another because um, I know that one of the old directors Gus Stewart Mm -hmm. who is now out in Portugal Gus was gutted that he couldn't come to it because he would have been another one that, that had been to the mall could still be a director you know you were, I remember watching back the coverage of the Scottish Cup final you are obviously on the, the panel that day I managed to see some of the outtakes when the goals went in uh, you weren't hiding your colours that day no I, I mean I, I tell everybody this and I, my happiest time in my career was at St Johnson without a doubt you know I had a, a brilliant chairman and Jeff the best chairman I ever worked for very honest and just told you how it was I had great managers under that time mainly Paul Sturrock more than anything else Paul was brilliant I'd known Paul from my time at Dundee United he brought me to St Johnston um, and I had a wonderful time there and I still go on holiday with Alan Kermahan uh, Paul Kane Roddy Grant's been away with us uh, Kevin Thomas many years ago used to come away with us and it's been well because of Covid it's the first time in 21 years that myself and Kano and Alan Kernan and having been away to Portugal for a week um, so we still keep in touch we still see each other I actually seen Kano yesterday when we were out for a walk he's a good friend of mine and you know I, I speak to Alan on a regular basis as well that that team at that time um, I think Paul Sturrock had them pretty much like socialising was a massive part of that squad at that time basically every week you were out doing something or another together as a group well, well it was when Paul had his bad turn at Tannadice that day um, it took a number of weeks off when he collapsed at Tannadice and um, he came back and he, he, he said basically we're going to work from 9 till 5 it didn't mean we were on the training ground from 9 till 5 but it really brought us together um, and it was unfortunately round about this time because we raised money for the Dunblane tragedy mm -hmm. we had done walk we, we, I think we'd done a 10 or 12 mile walk through the hills of Perth we would go go-karting um, against the local Tayside police they would have, then have their firearm squad out when we, we had them at Clay Pigeon shooting we would then go to Bingo with Aggie <laughs> um, we would just do stuff together we would all do stuff together and then we also made sure that we had a night out once a month whether it be in Perth whether it be in Edinburgh whether it be in Glasgow and if you didn't turn up you got fined so everybody was there we had a fancy dress night which was brilliant with a, 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 a 70s and 80s night everybody had to dress up it was great as well and it just really brought the whole team together we weren't the best team um, but we were certainly uh, team spirit wise we had the best team in Scotland at that point we were, we were really in it together you know I, but the season you're in reference 98-99 finished third League Cup final I wouldn't say it wasn't the best squad it was a good team of players but there wasn't any kind of massive egos there wasn't any superstars in that team no there wasn't we had guys obviously but Alan come up and I always remember Alan Kermahan signing we had um, we were playing on the Sunday night in a cup tie and uh, I think it was against Celtic and Roddy got two yellow cards he came on as a sub Roddy and uh, Alan's Alan's telling us he said I'm watching I'm, I'm coming up the following day to sign on loan for St Johnson he said that there were a minute to go the ball comes in uh, Roddy's at the back post hand it's going above then. his head and he handballs it in Aye. for a second yellow and he's sent off and he's just thought to himself 
where am I going? What is this clown all about? You know, and it was brilliant. It was it was just typical Roddy. And Alan came into the changing room, and as as like everybody, they get slaughtered as soon as you walk in. Everybody got slaughtered as soon as you signed for St. Johnson. Didn't matter who you were. The worst one I seen was um, we had beat Hibs at Easter Road, and Roddy had it was about a couple of minutes to go. We beat them one 0 I took a free kick on the left, and Roddy just a little simple bit of movement, wet and short, come back and, and bulleted a header. And it was Darren Dodds that was picking him up. So Dodds signs for us a few weeks later, and the two entrances at St. Johnson. And you come in through the top entrance or you come come down the side of the stairs right into the changing rooms. So we used to come down the side of the stairs and Paul Sturrock was bringing Darren down the stairs and Roddy looked up and went, you have no signed him, he's shite. <laughs> and that was, a, that was like a welcome to St Johnston for Darren Dodds. <laughs> it was brilliant uh, but Dodgy was great a brilliant player for St Johnston Aye. you know we went to Johnny Fox as everybody does oh, in Inverness you, you yep. go to Johnny Fox's we were in there and uh, Darren Dodge is getting drunker and drunker so I'm, I'm away outside and I put my fingers on the exhaust of the car and I come in and I rub his face alright Dodgy how you doing like that? <laughs> so his face is all black ash and he's, and he's not got a clue so we've also he's, he's, he's cash, and he's also got uh, condoms we've got condoms and we've put them on his on his shoulder he's, you know and he's just standing there and he's saying to me you're making an arse of yourself he's covered in ass and he's got condoms on his shoulder a big diddy but, uh, but a great lad just a a brilliant lad as well you know we had a great car you know Kano myself uh, Roddy would, would, would join us Darren Dodds uh, we Marco McCullough we, we used to put Marco in the boot of the car because there was too many of us he used to get in the boot of the car every day and we'd drive up then 90 with Marco in the boot what kind of car was that a Fiat 500 no, we had a, <laughs> what it was, uh, um, but we had, uh, we had a sponsored car we had a sponsored car for Mackie Motors and Marco used to sit in the boot it was incredible the stuff we used to do but it was, it was just, a, just such a funny time and everybody that came to that club was welcomed but slaughtered but that's just the way we were you yeah, know, and it's how you handle it you either sink or swim and everybody at that time was, was swimming you know brilliant Dan yeah sorry I'm just getting distracted someone's viewing the flat above mine so yeah <laughs> hello um, it's, uh, just walked past my window um, <laughs> no sorry Alan um, just a quick actually sort of on that theme and you're talking about the, the cars coming up and all that was it around that time where Paul Sturrock had the rule that you had to live in a certain vicinity of Perth <laughs> No, that was that that was at Dundee United. When I was at Dundee United yeah. as a kid, we had, to, we had to live within ten miles of the stadium in Dundee. But that that never happened in Perth. I stayed in Edinburgh my whole time. So did Kano. Roddy Grant stayed in Livingston. A lot of the Glasgow boys and guys like Jim Weir and that moved up to Perth. Um, Kevin McGowan, people like that, they moved up. But no, we just we just travelled from Edinburgh. We would meet at the bridge. We like we like to get in for about quarter past nine. So we'd meet at the fourth bridge together. Um, maybe three or four of us, and then we'd jump in Roddy's car and. I would drive most of the time because Roddy would be half, half drunk the night before. And uh, so I would drive. Reeking of fags. Um, we would get up. <laughs> we, would get, we would get up to Perth and we'd always be first in, waiting on everybody coming in. And then the fun started. It was like being at school, hmm. you know. And um, I remember when Alan, Alan Kermahan stayed in the hunting tower and he came up on loan and he... Um, he was, he was always in early as well. He liked to laugh and a joke. He'd bring the papers in and he'd sit and have a laugh and a cup of tea with Alan. But this day he wasn't in. And myself and Roddy were injured um, and we tried to phone him because it wasn't like him not to be in the, in the, the stadium. Mm-hmm. And we thought, this isn't right. You know, and they were, we knew he was diabetic. So we phoned the hunting tower and said, you're going to have to go into his room and check him. He's diabetic. And right enough, he'd taken a bad turn. He'd got a bad reading on his machine and he'd collapsed. And um, so myself and Roddy we instantly went along to the hunting tower. Mm-hmm. The club doctor came as well. Um, and he needed just some, his blood sugar levels were down. He needed a Mars bar. He needed some Coca-Cola. And he was yep. as right as rain. It didn't stop myself and Roddy having some food on the club's bill. So we just stuck it on the club's bill. And whether or not the club knew it to this day, I don't know. He needed five fillet steaks. That's what he needed to get him over it. We had to eat it. Um, I, speaking of Kernan, I... We had to stay with him, so we thought we would just uh, we would, we would fill our faces while we were there. Ah, Jeff would have been delighted at that. Well, I know. I hope he doesn't see this, because he'll probably come after us for the money. Exactly. Um, we won't forget that. We actually did a Twitter poll about the best St. Johnson games that made Dermot in the 90s. The games we had were a 5-0 win against Aberdeen. We had... Uh, the one 0 European game and the one that came out on top was the seven two game against Dundee, Dundee on New Year's Day. You were in the starting lineup. Yeah. What's your memories of that one? My memories were I was sick the night before I was ill. I'd eaten something and it didn't feel great. Um and obviously we went on. Chick Charlie was fighting with his own one of his own players uh, that day. Robbie well, Rayside, if yeah. I remember right. And I and I got take I got taken off with about a minute, two or three minutes to go. Um I remember that and I remember sitting in the dugout 
and Dundee scored late on and John Blackley was going mental and his false teeth flew out onto the <laughs> onto the gravel and he's picked them up and he's trying to put them back in and spitting out gravel and all that. <laughs> but it was brilliant. It was a great performance. Um, great to beat Dundee, you know, in, in New Year. It was just, it was wonderful. But yeah, I would agree with you. I think that's certainly one of the, the best games we'd played them. We absolutely destroyed them. They were lucky to get away with seven. Uh, Very lucky, you know. Like, but it could have been double figures that day. We can confirm that story about John Blackley's teeth is true because Kieran McInnesby said the same thing off air uh, during the chat. He said, <laughs> he said exactly the same thing. His teeth came flying. I'm saying it on air. Well, that was it. We slipped, but they were brilliant. As I say, him and Paul were, were good cop, bad cop mainly. There was a few times when uh, I had played, as everybody played, but he had, he had come to me one time, Paul Sturrock, after the game and he, and he turned around and he was shouting a ball and then he turned out the sloop and he'd say, mind me never to play him again, pointing at me. He will never play for me again. And he tried to throw a cup, and it, instead of it being a, a crockery cup, it was, it was Paul Astyde. <laughs> and as he threw it, the tea went all over him and burnt himself. So we couldn't stop laughing. But um, I, was, I was playing again on the Saturday. You know, that was just Paul. Aye. You know, he, he, would just, he would let it go. He would, let it, he would just let it slide. And, but they were brilliant together. They were really good at that, that club. Um, what St. Johnson said to me, Sam, is a, a real good team spirit. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, it goes on. I see it now. And I've always said that. I don't know what they do. It goes from chairman to chairman, it goes from manager to manager to manager, and it goes from squaddy players to squaddy players. They seem to have a brilliant um, work ethic and team spirit about every single person at St Johnston. And long may that continue, because that's what got us the, the slight bit of success that we had, you know, getting to the cup final, getting in Europe and all the rest of it. But it was, it was down to the team spirit that we had. You know? yeah, aye. Well, Paul and John Blatter moved to Dundee United. Sandy Clark came in. Was it like starting again? Did you know Sandy before he came in? I did. I didn't have a great relationship with Sandy. Sa- Sandy, I was at Hearts. Joe Jordan had taken me to Hearts and uh, Sandy was the reserve youth team manager at Hearts mm-hmm. at the time. And then when Joe got sat, Sandy took over and instantly said, I don't want you, I'm, you're no for me, which is fine, I don't mind that. But I had, um, I was due some money coming in and he tried to force me out the door and I wasn't having it. And they'd, they'd gone away somewhere in pre-season and I got left with the young boys. But that 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 close season, I had, I was as fit as I've ever been. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd worked hard on my game um, and then Joe lost his job. But that's football. Like, yeah. Just do things right. Do things right. Don't try and force you out the door, you know. So eventually, once I got um, something sorted with the chairman, I then left, I went to Dunfermline briefly and then on to St. John. And obviously, Sandy then became the manager. So I was a bit apprehensive when he came, I must admit, because Paul Sturrock had phoned me and said, I'd like to take you back to Dundee United if possible. He says, but I've told Sandy that you've done a good job for me. And the first day I was in, Sandy called me into his office and said, listen, what are under the bridge? Paul said, you've done well for him, so we'll see how it goes, but I want to keep you here. So I was like, fine, no worries, you know. Brilliant. I want to touch on, um, you're in a couple of finals with Saints. Um, I want to touch on one which will probably long live in the memory, uh, which was the Challenge Cup final again, <laughs> aye, against Stranraer. We lost 1-0 that day. I was there and it was probably the worst weather. It's not a great stadium for it because it's like a wind tunnel at the no. best of times. So, what can you say about that? It was a great goal for Danny. <laughs> um, <laughs> great ping. If I remember right. <laughs> Aye, and uh, the weather, you're right, I've never played in conditions like that in my life. But, you know, all credit to Stranraer, they would have got a side. And uh, it was disappointing. And again, after the game, Paul was under real pressure, severe pressure. And Jeff could have bulleted him for that result alone. Mm -hmm. But all credit to Jeff, he seen the bigger picture. And Paul came in and says, right, we're going to win the league this year. That's it. We're going to win the league, you know. And um, so be it. That was the case. uh, And he was great. Paul was very good on the training field, you know, very tough on us. But that game... Is one that I, I don't you don't really like to remember it because it was such a, a dreadful day, such a dreadful occasion for St Johnston. Um and no one I, I look back on very fondly. I'll be getting to a final, but it wasn't it wasn't great. Not not doesn't live in the memory. No, I, I wouldn't blame you. You might remember this guy. We talked about him last week in the podcast and we can't find any more information on him. We toyed about bringing this guy up. A guy called Peter Fear. He was a Peter big Fear. He was a big, big striker. Sweet, aye. He played in that Challenge Cup final. He played four games. He came in, played four games and buggered off to, again. <laughs> any <laughs> well, knowledge him? No, not at all. You... A big a big striker that was clearly not for us, not for Paul, not for St. Johnston. Came in, played in the cup final. Um, it's one that, as I said to you, it's no one I can remember <laughs> that he played because he didn't do particularly well. We had some good strikers over the period at St. Johnson, and he certainly wasn't one of them. But no blaming him. We were poor on the day. Yeah. Now I don't really know much about Peter Fear, just at the name that you would remember. 
Aye, because I texted Kieran McInnesby to find out, and he he said oh, I can remember the name, but he must have le- left absolutely no lasting impression whatsoever. The boy. Well, we Paul, Paul used to bring in random guys. I remember he brought in. He tried to sign. I'm sure he tried to sign a striker. I think was it Norway. He tried to sign a striker from. And he thought the deal was done and he wouldn't come because he wouldn't want to leave his dog. We talked about this. Um, uh, Lars Gunnar Karlstrand, his name was, he was Swedish. I, he, he ended up signing for Swedish. Leicester. Yep, Swedish guy. We talked about him in the same, so, the same skill set. Yeah, his dog, his Rottweiler Ted, didn't want to leave him behind. So we, we used to leave cans of dog food at Paul's door. <laughs> and honestly, it would go mental. <laughs> I'll kill you if you ever do that. We used to leave cans of pedigree chum and all that at his door. He would go off his nut. But it was just all part of the fun. You know, he, him and John were, were part of it. But what Paul and John really did is they let us sell place to change in them. You know, we had good pros in there like Jim Weir and, and Alan May and Kearney himself, Kano, uh, really good professional players. And we would look after the younger boys. You know, mm-hmm. if they were out of line, they, they would be checked. They would be told, you know, that's no that's no on. You know, but we had some talent. Paddy Conley was, John O'Neill was one of the most gifted players I think I've ever seen in a St. Johnson jersey. Could play him anywhere. Two-footed, yeah. um, Scotland International. Brilliant. John O'Neill was absolutely fantastic. But as I said, we used to sell police the changing room. And we had a lot of younger guys. Stephen Tosh came in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin Twaddle came in, a guy called uh, Stuart McLean came in, Trigger, who was difficult. Gary Farker was in as yep. well. He was for the Highlands. Highlands it was Ewan Donaldson. You know, he, Ewan Usually. Donaldson, he liked, he liked, Gary liked a drink quite a lot. And then, so you just had to try and put them on the straight and narrow. It didn't always work, mm-hmm. but you just had to, you know, point them in the right direction and make sure that they were given the best advice that you could give them at that point. And a lot of them, funnily enough, I was out walking two days ago and I seen Kevin Twaddle. Okay. And he texts me, and Kevin was very. Kevin is now a different guy. Yeah. To what he was. Very much so. Yeah. Back back then, you know, I used to pick Kevin up in the morning. Um, didn't drive. Had no intentions of driving. Was gambling all his money. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we would we would come up, and it wasn't. We used to ask them for petrol money because we'd all do it. At the start of every week, we'd fill the car up and if it needed filled up again on a Thursday, we'd all contribute again. And Kevin had no money. He's like, but you're going up anyway. But we're like, but I know, but how are you going to get up if we don't get up? I'd, it was only, it was about 10 or 15 quid a week. It wasn't a lot. And he wouldn't give us any money. So we said, right, that's it. We're not picking you up. And he thought, oh, that'd be it. But we seen him, he used to get the bus up. He used to get the stagecoach bus up to <laughs> Perth because we weren't picking him up. And it was a valuable lesson for him. Pay your way, you know. I used to drop him off at his house and he would uh, and he would just go walk back to the bookies. Right. Um, but see now, what a completely different guy. He's a lovely guy, man. Really nice. I'm not saying he wasn't a lovely guy then, but he's a much better person now. You know, does work for charities, he's yep. running a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, he's always got kind words to say about people. But at that stage of his life, somebody, somebody really had to get a grip of Kevin because, you know, he's wrote a book. I'm not so sure he gambled a million quid because that would mean two million before tax. And I don't know if he's earned that much, <laughs> but he's not going to sell a book if he says, I've, I've only gambled 50 grand. <laughs> you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to hopefully meet him in the next few while, see how he's getting on. As you, as you try and do, you know, you try and speak to guys that, 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 you, you, that you know and like. And then I'm, so I'm going to try and catch up with him and maybe take Kano along and we'll grab a coffee when this thing blows over. Yeah, well, I listen. We had Kevin Twaddle on for about two hours, and we just sat back and listened to his, all his stories. He actually brought up the fact that he used to get a bit pissed off that he dropped him about half a mile from his house. And he was like, "Why the fuck did you drop me off here? Why did you not drop me off my front door?" He just, he was just single minded, eh? Just, but he's a oh, yeah, you have no reformed. idea, you know. I, I mean, I would pick him up in the morning, and then I'd take him home, mm-hmm. and you, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't get anything for it. You know, know that you asked for anything, but you asked for him to contribute to the petrol money from the bridge to Perth, like everybody, you know, Kano. Myself, Dodsey, Roddy, we'd all put petrol money in. And uh, throughout the whole period I was at St. Johnson's River, we were travelling with, this is the rules, this is what happens. We meet on a Monday, we fill the car up, we all contribute to it, and then we go with it. But he was like, I've no money, I can't do it. You know, and it was always on a Monday after a weekend. But thankfully, he's turned his life around now. Yep. Um, and I'm, I'm, gl- I'm glad to hear it. You know, I really am. I hope you weren't charging Mark McCulloch petrol money if he's stuck in the boot. We used to have a, we used to have a, ga- we used to have a game um, where we had to... Uh, do various things. I, I, I used to like, I would talk about the telly. Did you see this on the telly? See that? So I wasn't allowed to talk about the TV in the car. Kano wasn't allowed to talk about Hibs in the car. Uh, Darren Dodge used to get really excited. You know, when you spoke to him, he would get very, very excited. So he wasn't allowed to get excited about anything. <laughs> so if he, cracked, if he cracked a joke, he would laugh at it himself. Marco, we had to make sure that Marco had to speak every minute. So when he was in the book, he had to say something. <laughs> so you knew he was still okay. Um, so we knew he was still there. <laughs> And uh, Roddy, Roddy just told lies all the time. So Roddy, would, if he got caught, so we used to find everybody a pound a pound. And we had something like, I'm not saying about 200 pounds sitting for the Christmas night out. And Darren Dodds 
foolishly gave it to Sandy Clark to put into the, the kitty for everybody else to uh, to drink. It was crazy. But that was <laughs> dodgy because he was the one that was keeping the money. But Darren Dodge won the PA Player of the Year one year. And he won a, he won a high five. You know, at the time, the big high Aye. fives to Gordon Barham and the PA. So me and Roddy, we had uh, took it through to the, the, the physio's room and we weighed it, got the exact weight of it. And we took the high, the high five out and filled it with bricks to the exact weight. <laughs> And Dodgy took a box of bricks home to his missus for winning Player of the Year. <laughs> and then when he came back, we, hung his, we, we, we put his clothes up the flagpole as well. So his, his jeans and his T-shirt were flying in the wind on the flagpole. He was tall but enough. You'd be tall enough to reach it anyway, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was a great guy. Great lad. But a, bo- a butt of all jokes. So we'll talk about happier times in cup competitions. One of the bigger goals that you're, you're well known for with St. Johnson for all ages was your goal against Hearts at Easter Road in the League Cup semi-final. What a peach that was. Aye, it was all right. We had uh, we played Hearts a few weeks before at Tynecastle. We drew one all, and I scored there as well. So going into the game, we didn't hold any fears. You know, we really didn't. And we'd gone away. I'm sure we'd gone away to a hotel um, down in Dunbar, and then we drove up to Easter Road. And what I remember, was a great St. Johnson crowd that night. They were, they were housed at the, the way end at Easter Road, yep. but they were up the top tier. Mm-hmm. And then we, we, we play the game and Nick Dazovic put us ahead about six, seven minutes before half time and we'd have been delighted to go on 1-0. But then I got the ball and then from Miguel and then as soon as I let fly, as soon as I hit it, I knew it was in. One of them that you think he's never going to save that. And then it put us 2-0 up and we knew we just had to continue the same the same vein in the second half. Hearts were a good side. You know, they had won the Scottish Cup as well. They were a very good side. But then we put the icing on the cake with George getting the, the third a uh, couple of minutes of time and then it was... Part of the time it was celebrations, we're in the changing room after it got mental. Decided to go up the town after it in Edinburgh. Myself, Kano, Roddy, a few of the boys. And as you do, um, I think, where can we go? Who do, who do we know late on in Edinburgh? So Roddy knew the guy that owned the lap dancing club. So he phoned him and says, can we come along? <laughs> so we went to the lap dancing club in Lodi and Road Bottoms Up, it's called. So we went in there. I know the one. I, I um, mean, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, so the girl, the girl comes along as she does and says, can I do anything for you? And I say, die, can you put the telly on my highlights of my goals coming on? And can you get 20 fags for my mate Roddy? It was brilliant. It was a great night. We had a good, we had a good night, a good laugh. And then, um, you know, we obviously looking forward to the final, which was brilliant. It was indeed. Uh, just on that uh, lap dance story, uh, me, my dad and his pals went down to Newcastle. I think Newcastle v Stoke. So we all got into a lap dancing bar at midday. We asked them to put the telly on because Saints were playing Celtic that day. So there was nine of us gathered <laughs> around a telly and all the lap dancers were wanting a bit of the act. But piss off the football. That's band. what happened. <laughs> That's what happened that night. It was the only place we could go for a late pint in Edinburgh. You know, in midweek, everywhere was shut in and that was the place to go. So it was it was fine. You know, it was it was no problems at all. I'm just imagine a lap dancing bar in Newcastle at midday. Oh, it's, it's very much the reserve squad they've got in the gym. I the say day. B team will be out for that. <laughs> but no, it was good that to get into the final was great. You know, we knew it was going to be difficult against a good Rangers side. Had one of cup winners in their team. You know, um, we were a really good team, but you know, we acquitted ourselves very well. And Nick scored a great goal again. A brilliant goal, Nick scored. Get us back in the game. And we just couldn't could we pull it off. And it was it was disappointing, but we had acquitted ourselves very well that year. You know, as I say, at that time we had we'd finished third as well uh, and qualified for Europe. Kano scored the header against Dundee, mm-hmm. which again was a crazy night in Perth. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Myself and Roddy, we'd been down to Leeds Bradford for operations. We were getting our groins sliced open, basically our hernias done, and mm-hmm. our doctors released, so the two of us were down there. So we came back for the game, so we are sitting in the director's box when Kano scores the header. And my, my Biden memory is Dr. McCracken sliding on his knees. Aye, going mental, Brilliant. yeah. Absolutely. St. So Johnston Daft, the most, the most wonderful person you could ever meet. And for him, it was just, Brilliant to see. So qualifying, um, finishing third, qualifying for Europe. So we're in, as you do, we're down to that bar in Perth. I don't know if it's still it's there. It's still, still there very much, at. so yeah. So we were in there getting buckets of beer and we had our, had our suits on. The fans were, were going crazy. The next minute, there's a full 11 aside game going on outside in the road, right outside that bar. We've got the jackets down. Me and Roddy are struggling, but we're still trying to jump in. <laughs> fans are playing. I've got my tie in my head. Fans are playing. It was brilliant. The next minute, the police come and the police and the big police fans because we're holding up traffic. So the next minute, we're all in the back of the police van, but in a good way. Yeah. I'm sitting in the front. I'm sitting in the front with Roddy. All the boys are in the back. We're now going to the ice factory in the back of the police van. 
I've got the police hat on and Roddy's asking for the Ninos. Can you put the Ninos on? <laughs> <laughs> so we got the Nino, we got the Ninos on all the way to the ice factory and then we went and had a night in there as well. It was just great times, you know. Bro, yeah, you, you've you've never kind of shied away from the fact that the, the, the best time of your playing career was with St. Johnson. Um, hampered by injury near the later stages, had to retire at 30. You're not outspoken the fact about plastic pitches and that maybe being the main cause of it. We well know your opinion on plastic pitches. They don't belong in the top game. No, I, I, I just think it's not a good look for our game. I think that there is 90, 92 or 96 clubs in England. There is not one plastic pitch, you know. Um, now, I get it. I get the finances for the clubs that I've got. I, I get that. But I just don't think it's a good look when we're trying to promote the game around the world, sell it to America, China, wherever, sell our game all over the place. It just looks amateurish for me. And, and there's no place for it. Now, it has come on a lot. It's come on a lot since I... Obviously, was was training and playing on it. Um, it was concrete based then. It's a lot different now. I just don't like it. You know, I've, I've never liked it. I don't think it's a natural bounce. Um, it's a non-contact sport as well because players don't try to tackle the same. You know, no. hardly anyone tackles in a game. And then I was at Livy one with the, with the, with the new one laid and the black <sighs> pellets, pellets were all over yeah. the place. It was going on people's eyes. It was going all over the place. It was in yeah. my mouth. And it was just horrible. And then you read a study where in America they're, they're suing companies with black pellets that that's going in their mouths because they say it could be cancerous. There's no there's no facts on it, no. but you know what Americans are like. Right. They'll do anything. Their young goalies have been diving and, and swallowing the pellets. So I, it's just not for me, and I just don't think it's a good look. I wish we could get it out of the league, but I don't think we can because we've got three teams in it. It would need two to get relegated, and then the other the rest of the teams in the league would then need to vote to get it out. I would, I would love it to be out, but I don't think it will be, I'm afraid. The rule should be, if you come into the top flight, you should go back to grass. It's mm-hmm. as simple as that. you know. And, and even if there's funding to help the clubs to, to lay the pitch mm-hmm. from the SFA, from the from the league, whatever, take money out of the TV money, just in case. Although money's tight, but I just I just don't like it. And, I, and I'll never change my mind. No. And I get, I get a hard press from Livingston fans saying, I don't like the club. It's not that I don't like the club. It's that I don't like the pitch. You know, when I was there, Livingston had a wonderful Great draft pitch, pitch, one yep. of the best in the league. Um, you know, and it See, they see it plastic, and I'm actually there tomorrow uh, watching the Hamilton game. Um, so that's the El Plastico derby. The two of them <laughs> playing against each other. So it'll be it'll be fun and games, but uh, and some I don't see great games on them either. No. I really don't. So hopefully tomorrow it'll be five all, but I can't see it. Fingers crossed for that one. We'll, we'll touch on Livy. Um, you left Saints. We had to retire. You went down to Macclesfield with yeah, uh, yeah. D- Davenport again, a former player of Saints. Be familiar. But you went into Livingston during what can be described as what the banter years, uh, some some terrible goings on um, financially. You did some coaching, scouting, first team. You went in as reserve coach. I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they got promoted to the Premier League, they then ran a reserve team, and I'd just come back from Macclesfield. I was down with Peter, and I could have stayed there. Peter lost his job, um, but they wanted me to stay on, and I thought, nah, it's not for me. You know, Peter take me down, so I decided to come back up the road, and then I got a call from John Robertson, who was a uh, First team coach at Livy at the time saying, mm-hmm. listen, we're looking for someone. There's three or four in for it. Come along and interview for it. I'll put in a good word for you. And he did. And I managed to, to get the job, which was great. Uh, and I had a great time. Loved it. You know, we had some top young boys, Robert Snodgrass, Graham Dorans, James McPake, uh, Richie Britton, who did sign for Saints and didn't. But all these guys, you know, that were there, a really good youth set up. And it was, it was a great time to be at Livingston. And we didn't know what was going on in the background we, we genuinely didn't and I still to this day think that the debt that Livingston run up and had was manageable Dominic Keane the chairman kept telling us that but we were the fall guys for another club who had treble the debt that we had but their chairman was more influential with the bank let's say so we were the ones that were put forward to have the fall mm-hmm. um, as where the other club eventually fell as well you know but we were put forward and that was a that was a dreadful time because going through administration, you have people, young boys starting off their career are losing jobs. You've got senior professionals are losing jobs. You've got office staff. You've got the catering staff. You've got groundsmen. We've gone for 42. Um, it was just horrible, a horrible situation to be in. Um, but it galvanised us really and um, we went on to win the League Cup, which was a phenomenal achievement considering everything that we'd gone through. And I, and I keep saying that Livingston is a fairy tale club. I mean, I'm an Edinburgh boy, Meadow Bank it was, brought up to where I stayed, two miles from where I stayed, moved out to Livingston. And it was heartbreaking to see all the buses from Rangers, Celtic, Cats and Hibs leaving the town every weekend to go and watch these clubs. It was difficult to generate a fan base, but we had a great team. We, you know, we finished third in the league, we won the League Cup, uh, qualified for Europe, and um, 
you know, she had some really good players as well. But it just the way it ended with the administration was just horrible. And then the club, to see the club jump from Pierce Flynn to the Italian owners and on and on, it's it's been one thing from another. And it's a credit to them that and David Martindale more importantly that he's got them in that cup final that St Johnson thankfully won. Mm-hmm. Because when St Johnson were in the bottom league, I thought that'll be them. That's them there for a long, long time. And now the job for Davy and the club is to make sure that it's uh, sustainable in the Premier League, but equally that they can stay in that Premier League for 10, 12, 15 years. You know, just like St Johnson will do. Yep. They want to be a Premier League side every single year now. And can they do that? That's that's the battle ahead for them. That completely understandable. Martindale certainly one of the solid managers, a good Livingston base. ex Cayman Island manager, Maximo, what, I can't even remember his name. Oh, Maximo, Maximo Barcelos was his name. That's um, the guy. He was uh, a bit different. Dominic Keane was on holiday and actually met him on Lynn Line and a Sun Lounger next to him. And because he was Brazilian and he's obviously, Dominic's had a, a gin or two too many, he had managed to convince him to give him the job. And we had finished third, then finished ninth with Davy Hay and, and leash in charge with Robbo and myself doing the coaching. And Dominic decided ninth wasn't good enough. And when you're getting a fan base of two and a half, three thousand, like St. Johnson, St. Johnson gets get more. I think surviving in the league is brilliant. Aye. For a club with a, with a fan base, I really do. And I think that, you know, Livingston especially should be happy to stay in the league. St. Johnston, punch above their weight. Stevie Brown always says it, and rightly so. Don't say it with punch above their weight. Mm-hmm. We're there on merit, and they are there on merit. Yep. But when you look at the size of the crowd, when you look at the budget, St. Johnston and Livingston at that time were punching above their weight. So mm-hmm. Marcio comes in, and immediately he's not got a clue. And I mean, not got a clue. We, um, you do boxes, like 10 by 10 possession boxes. Yeah. You know, 10, 10, 10 yards by 10 yards, 5v2 piggy in the middle. Um, and he would say in Brazil, he's always, his main saying was in Brazil, in Brazil. And he would say in Brazil, two keep the ball off five. And I'm like, that's impossible. <laughs> that's completely impossible. You know, two people can't he keep the ball off five. But in all of in Brazil, we do this and we do that. And I think at the time that the movie Mike Bassett was out, the England manager, Mike what? Bassett. Well, he was him. He had the same initials. He had a straight, had the boys training with it, the balls one day. The, the stuff he'd done was phenomenal. So I, I couldn't get on with him. I mean, Davy and Leash had been put up to, well, Davy was director of football and Leash was on the board at the time. They had been, they had been removed for the man. And I was on the phone to Davy every day. You know, come on, Davy, you need to come back. You know, John, John Robertson had gone to end mess. And um, I'm like, you need to come back, you know. And he's like, no, you know, I'm, I can't. Dominic's made the decision. So we run with it, you know. But the guy was totally and utterly clueless. We had gone down to York for pre-season. And this is when I knew he would just come in. And this is when I knew he was a fraud. We had played York in a friendly. We'd been down for a few days. David Leash were coming down to the game. Um, but Dominic was there, the chairman. And we were down. And um, we're 2-0 down at half time, And we're hopeless. And I mean hopeless. So I say to him as we're walking up the tunnel, you need to get into them. You need to get in, in about them. You mm-hmm. need to change them. And, and he's like, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do. So I'm like, right, okay. He says, you, you need to take it. I'm like, right. So I sat, he sat down and I made a few cha- uh, changes of shape. I made a few substitutions. And we ended up winning the game 3-2. We're back on the bus after it, having come back to 2-0 down to 3-2. So I'm actually docking is the coach driver, which is great. Um, uh, my local mob, I'm Octor Arder, so that they're just around the corner. So, they're brilliant. Yeah. They're, 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 they're magnificent. They've been great at St. Johnson and at Livingston. Colin is uh, Neil, Do- Neil Docherty sitting driving. He's the driver. So right behind him is, is a very drunk Jim Leishman and a very drunk David A. Across the aisle is Dominic Keane on his own. So there's a spare seat beside Dominic. So I come on the bus with Marcio. So I sit behind Davey and Leash and I'm whispering, put my head through between the two seats saying, this guy's no, this guy's not got a clue what he's doing. So he sits beside Dominic, the chairman. Yeah. And I, and I hear him and the, and the chairman says, Marcio, brilliant, great comeback, well done. What did you do? And he says, Mr. Chairman, I, I changed the shape, I changed the team, I changed, and I'm like that. You've done nothing. You've done absolutely sake. nothing. But that was him. And he was quite happy to to take the, the, the plaudits for things he never done. And and he, he sat, he sat in a in the boardroom one day and he told Davy Hay, Jim Leishman, Dominic, myself, how he had a formation to beat Celtic at Parkhead. We will beat Celtic at Parkhead. And I'm like, teams have tried for 100 years to beat Celtic <laughs> consistently. No, no, I've got a formation. I know what to do. We were 5-0 down at half time. 5-0 at half time down. He was, he was absolutely clueless. He summoned me in and he went, what's wrong? I said, I've had enough. I said, I, I can't go any, any more with this guy. I said, he's clueless. He's, um, he's harming me. 
is harming the club. But more importantly, your, your side's going to get relegated here. The club's going to get relegated if you don't make a change. And he went, right, go home. Just go home and I'll phone you tonight. And I thought that was me. I thought, he's not going to he's not going to get rid of him because he's going to, you know, he's went with him. He's made the change, getting rid of Davy and Leash. So he's going to stick with him. Mm-hmm. And then he phoned me about eight o'clock that night and says, right, I'll see you in the morning. That's him away. And um, I went in on the Saturday morning and Dominic said, yeah, yeah, he's had enough. He's clueless. He's, he's not got a clue what he's doing. And that was the end of him. And they, and they brought Davy back in. After that, you ended up taking a hot seat. <laughs> Briefly. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not one I wanted to take. I was no. 30, 33, coming up for 34. And at Livingston, where the home changing room is, right across the corridor, there's two offices. One was the manager and one was the coaches. Pierce Flynn called Davy Hay into the manager's office. And myself and Billy and Paul were sitting in the coach's office. Mm-hmm. And Davy, Davy come out and Davy went, he wants you to be the manager. And I went, me? He said, yeah, he's, he's, no, he's no keeping me on. And I went, nah, you're winding me up, Davy. He went, no, honestly. He said, he wants you to be the manager. He said, I'm done. He said, I'm seeing out the end of the season and then that's me. And I was like, but I'm not ready. It's, he went, honestly. So then I got called in by Pierce Flynn. And he says, listen, I know you're close to Davy, but we think that you're the man for the job. And, and I went, but... What about David? David's the best man for the job. Surely he's a guy, you know, he won the league cup. Or, he went, no, I want you to do it. And I went, I don't think I'm ready. He went, well, it's either take it or you're out of job. So I went away and spoke to David again with Billy and Paul. And um, David's like, you need to take it. And that's what I've done. But the, the money that we were given by Pierce wasn't a lot. It wasn't a big budget, you know, albeit he, he had come out in the press and said that biggest budget impressed and biggest budget yeah. third, second third biggest budget in the league he said behind Rangers and Celtic <laughs> now it was in a way but Craig Levine was a manager of Hearts at the time Craig Levine had 18 players already signed his budget was to get in two my budget was to get in 18 <sighs> so my budget was bigger but when you broke it down it was nothing uh-huh. you know the signing players that were players were taking an age to come back to us to say they would sign or not because they were getting offered at Division 1 at the time it wasn't the Championship it was Division 1 they were, I was competing with players in Division 1 at the time Jim Hamilton signed for next to nothing for us because he wanted to be back down the road but this was a brand new side that you know they were all coming together some of them had um, been through pre-season with us some of, some of them came late so they didn't have a pre-season and they were playing catch up all the time um, but I still believe to this day that myself and Alan would have kept him up. I've got no two ways about it that we would have kept him up. And then even at the end, I got called into the boardroom with Alan on a Friday afternoon or Thursday afternoon, whatever it was. And Vivian Kyle, who was the CEO at the time, was sitting in Pierce Flynn, the owner. And he says, I think enough's enough. And I agreed with him. I said, yeah, because I wasn't enjoying it. I was too young. I was inexperienced. Um, and I says, give Alan a job. Because he'd been a manager of Clyde and been very successful. I said, give Alan a job. And he went, no, no, we're going to look about. But I'd known, because of your contacts in the media, I'd known he had spoken to Richard Goff the night ah, before it, in a man. hotel in Glasgow. So I knew, and I said, you're giving it to Richard Goff. And he denied it. He said, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. I said, you're giving it to Richard Goff. And then, lo and behold, Richard Goff gets a job. You know, but, And that, that that's the thing that, that probably sickened me more than anything is I had a great chairman in Jeff, mm-hmm. brilliant chairman in Jeff. Um, the best and he treated people right I'm not saying everyone I mean, Pierce Flynn and my, my he, he wouldn't come to games he had more money invested in Celtic than he ever had in, in uh, Livingston you know he was a Celtic fan he wouldn't he would come to some games but not them all and then he had a he had a PR guy that was on the board Morris someone who used to give the players marks out of 10 so he would phone me at half five on a Saturday and say he's got he's got a four he's got a six he's got, and I'm like what what is Morris the PR guy what's his credentials to rate the players Yeah. but that's that's these are the things that were happening you know, but um, a really difficult time. And I know they got the Mark Guidi's working for St. Johnson now. He had wrote an article in his Sunday Mail that I had, <laughs> well, that I had, that I had stabbed David Hay in the back. Couldn't be fuller for the truth. But it, it, hurt, it hurt my wife, it hurt my mum and dad who were alive at the time. You know, it hurt my big sister to see the back pages that I had back stabbed David in the back. That wasn't the case. You know, David went on the record and, and spoke to another paper and said, nah, Alan doesn't know what's going on here. You know, it, it's new to us all. And the relationship I've got with David, David knows what I think of David Hay. We're talking about Sandy, when we, we used to go to Marbella every year. Mm-hmm. At the winter break, we would go to Marbella. Jeff would kindly let us go over. And we'd been over and again, that helps halfway through the season to galvanise the squad for the second half of the season. You get a night out or a couple of nights out. And there was a little pub up from the hotel that we used to go to on a Sunday afternoon. And Sandy was in charge at the time and Billy Kirkwood. So we'd gone to this pub. See, the curfew was about six o'clock at night. Be back at six Sunday night. You're training Monday morning. So there was myself, Alan, Hano, Roddy, usual suspects. Um, Jim Weir, I think Jim was there as well. So six o'clock came and went, nah, we're not going down the road. Eight o'clock came and went, nah. Next minute, the karaoke's wheeled in. 
still no going down the road. We're absolutely hammered. Sandy and Kirky then come in to the pub and sit and have a drink with us. So the mon- the following morning at training, he sits all the one everybody down and he said, he's all worked together and played together and he's have always got a good team spirit. Why would the rest of you know with them? And he trained them really hard and let us sit down and have glasses of water because we were off, <laughs> we were off toilet. Absolutely. And that was good. It was good. To, you know, it was good to do that. But they, they were the times, even at the start of the season, we used to go to um, used to go to Dublin when Paul Sturrock was in charge, mm-hmm. and we had nights out there. Jim Weir famously punched a door or kicked a door, drunk. And myself, myself, and John O'Neill were trying to try to shave the eyebrows off him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, he, and he woke up and we threw water over him and everything but Jim Jim was brilliant but couldn't handle his drink honestly he could not handle his drink he was a terrible drunk um, but just a, a great captain a good person to have as well but now he's running uh, Ironmans for fun I know I see that I mean I seen him I seen him uh, he was doing a Saints game I was up to BBC and he was doing the Coco for Saints TV and he's looking great you know he's looking very right. fit as always as Jim did it was always like that just he always struggled when you put a ball at his feet. He used to say that to him. You know, he said the uh, snooker cushions for boots. The other used to bounce off him. Um, but a great lad, great captain as well. Really, really good captain for us. In the um, Hall of Fame for that reason, eh? Oh, no, he thoroughly deserved it. And it was great. We all got invited up to the Hall of Fame when Jim was in. And it was great to get to come up and see Miguel was back, Nathan Lenz, uh, Gary Bolin was there. Um, obviously, Kano, Roddy, Nick does I've seen a, I've seen a Taylor. Nick, Nick's brilliant. Nick's, yep. Nick's a great lad. So you still see them, but uh, just happy times, happy, happy times. And we had uh, Gavin Price, MB, signed to us as well. Mm-hmm. You remember him? Yeah. And the, the very first trip we went to um, was Dublin again, and we told him you need your passport. <laughs> we didn't, but we told him that. So and he was one in the Edinburgh car that used to travel up to myself and Roddy and Kano. So he's driving. So Roddy slides the passport out his pocket and gives it to me. So I've got his passport as we're going to the airport. So we're like, passports, passports. Nobody had them, but we just said, so he, we said, you better go and see Paul Sturrock and tell him you've lost your passport. <laughs> so he's went over to Paul Sturrock and, and he's went, Gaffer, I've lost my passport. I'm really sorry. And, and Paul Sturrock, don't be an asshole. We don't need it for Dublin. <laughs> so we are, so we, we fly to Dublin. So we're on a night out. And uh, in his back of his passport, it used to have four emergencies called El Sabathgate to Thurzo. And this phone number, you know, you know, you back your passport or you put some emergencies down. Mm-hmm. So I'm, we're in the Temple Bar on a night out, and I went, what about that? And I'm in the cubicle, and, I'm saying, and I come back out, and I'm like, they're like, what's going on? I said, if anybody wants to have a good time, you have to phone Elsa Bathgate for Thurzo, and I rhymed off this phone number, and he's, Gavin Price is looking at me. <laughs> and he's went, what the? But it was just, these are the, the, the stupid daft things that we used to do, you know. Um, we used to train at a school way past hunting tower we used to train at a school about there for pre-season yeah. and we'd, we'd let Gavin get in the front of the car to go out there all fully closed on with his boots and he was fought for everything but I'd say to him there's a bit of a knocking in that front wheel go and get out and go and get out and have a look make sure that wheel's alright so he would get out we'd shut the door and, <laughs> Off you go. and he'd, have to, he'd have to run he'd have to run about three or four miles to training with his boots on <laughs> and you think you'd never fall for that again you'd never fall for that again the following day he fell for it again <laughs> This time, John Blackley picked him up. Get in the car, you an asshole. <laughs> but he was just, he was harmless fun, Gavin. A really good yeah. guy, you know? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, going back to the Jim Weir thing, you always tell stroppy teenagers not to punch doors <laughs> or walls or whatever because the door will win. With Jim, I don't know, I'd probably make him favourite for that. Well, he had, to, he had to pay the money for the door because there was a big hole in the door. I always remember we were coming back that night and he, we, were in the, we were in our room. Myself, John O'Neill, Kane O'Rod, they were all sitting, and he was literally, it was like a coat hanger, his arms were out, he was getting dragged along by Kevin McGowan or whoever, and dragged him along. He couldn't walk, he could not walk, he was that drunk. And we were shouting at him, Jimmy, two touch, look at you, you're hopeless. <laughs> and, and he's I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you, whoever you are. So he went to his bed, and then we're trying to get him up, threw water over him, trying to shave his eyebrows, and he chased us out and smashed the door, punched a hole in the door. Um, but that's Just a, gym, typical Jim. Nah, we'll talk about David Witherspoon briefly. You must be delighted for 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 David. Ah, he's, he's the most decorated St Johnston player. Yeah, because he's played in both finals. There's mm-hmm. no there's no many that have started both finals. I think he's the only one actually yep. that started yeah. both finals. So the most decorated St Johnston player, great accolade to have. Signed a new new two year deal. Um, hopefully get a testimonial at the end of it as well. Mm-hmm. And that, that's that's the good thing with St Johnston, and that I think that's a credit to the club that there's. Nowadays, for players to stay at one club for that length of time, Liam Craig's done it over two periods. Murray's done it. Um, David will do it. 
And then you look at Ando doing it as well. Jim Weir done it. Alan Main, Roddy Grant, you know, Dave McKay. You got a testimonial? And I got one. I, I didn't do that a lot of years um, because but I, I didn't mind because I had to retire through injury. Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was a tough period for me because I thought I was going to get back fit. Um, and then I went down to York. I was told by the surgeon in York that you know I've got a 97% success rate of you know getting you back playing. And I went down, had the operation um, and come back and I had a letter for the doctor, Dr. McCracken, but I didn't open it. It was, it was addressed to him and I should have maybe opened it, but I didn't. And um, I went in to see the doc with a letter the following day and he went, how'd it go? I said, that ah, was fine, nah, no problem. And he read the letter and he went, you need to sit down. And I went, what? He said, you'll never, you can't play again. That's you. And I was devastated. I had absolutely heartbroken. When I was 29. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was toiling, really struggling. I had pains in my groin that the physio couldn't detect. And for months I trained and played and I was just, in, I was in bits. And then so thankfully Jeff gave me a testimonial, which helped. And then I landed the job at Macclesfield as well. And then the rest is history. You know, it's, um, but I've got to credit St. Johnston and Jeff, more importantly, for doing that for me. I didn't have to do that because I didn't hit there a lot of 10 years. I hit seven and a half, seven, seven and a half years. But he awarded me a testimonial and I got it um, because I had to retire through injury. And I was, I'll ever be thankful for everyone at St. Johnston for that because it was it was a difficult period in my life. I didn't know where I was going to go all. I had known this football from the age of, when I first started playing boys club level and then at Dundee United as an S for him at 12, onto the full time at 16. I had nothing else in my background. I had my coaching badges that I was doing, but I had nothing else to turn back on. And I've, I, I count myself very fortunate to be even where I am now. And with the company I work for now, we're um, the number one football agency in the world, um, two years in a row. Um, so it's, it's going well. It's good. It's hard work. But to, to see guys like David, who we've had all the way through mm-hmm. from Hibernian, taking them on, and obviously at St. Johnston, and seeing, them, seeing the delight in them last week, and Liam Craig. You know, yeah. Liam was... Very emotional last last Sunday to see the, to these guys and and heart heartbroken for Murray because I've known Murray for his time at Livingston and you know the, for him to miss out in both cup finals is a real tough one for him but he's a character and he'll bounce back for that you know and I'm glad that he's, he's still playing because he could have the injuries he's had he could have taken the easy option and met up had enough but he keeps going and keeps going and he's still got a lot to offer aye yeah I completely agree uh, kind of testament to St Johnson as a club to like there's not many teams at all will have one player getting any kind of testimonial to have like 10 odd players in the last 10, 11 years to getting one. It kind of shows that, you know, you're always going to get your wages on time. You know, the club's well run. That's obviously down to the brown. So it's a, that's, and we're. Well, that was it. We, we had, um, the year we finished third in the league, we used to have to go up and see Stuart Duff. And Stuart used to have the smallest writing in the world. So we'd have to distract him when we were in talking about bonuses. So there would be a little posse of us would go up. So it would be Roddy, Kano, Jim Weir, Alan Main, and myself. So we'd have to try and distract Stuart so that one of us could see what he's writing, <laughs> see what he's got down. So the year the year we finished third, we uh, we went in and it's, it was X amount for whatever. It was. You, bearing in mind, brilliant for St Johnston, we would get a weekly bonus for winning games. So you would maybe get you know six seven hundred pounds for winning a game each. But there was a positional bonus as well at the end of the season. So we'd gone in and he went right. There's nothing for whatever it was, 10th, 9th, whatever. But then you would get 150,000 and then 200,000 split between the squad. Pro rata, how many games you played. And it got up to fourth. And it was it was 300,000 for fourth split. And they went, what about third? And he went, he's only finished third. But then we say, well, we kind of go back down the stairs with you no know, having a third position, you know? He went, all right, well, what do you want? And we're like, we'll take half a million. And he went, okay, let me speak to Jeff and I'll come back. And he came back to us and he went, right, he's got half a million for finishing third. So you can imagine when Kano scores that header against Dundee. <laughs> Don't give a shit about getting Darren, into Europe. <laughs> Darren Dodds played every game, virtually, and he got, he got about 40 grand in bonus. It was incredible, you know, wow. but the, the year after, the, the bonuses were cut because Jeff's like, we're not doing that again, Hi. you know. But uh, <laughs> it was great. It was just a great time to be a great club. You know, and you're right, you get your wages paid on time, you've got your bonuses paid on time, you've got well looked after, and it's still the same now, you know, it's, I think Jeff should have been someone that the SFA, SPFL should have employed and picked pick his brains because everything he said over the years, if you look back at what he said about the finances in the game, has all come true. Mm. It, it was years ahead. He deserves to be, for me, one of the, the best chairmen that, that Scotland's ever produced because when you look at his loyalty to, to managers, as well, and he used to always say he knew, he knew who his next manager was going to be because the managers would come and go 
hopefully they were successful, but if they weren't, and they were, uh, sorry, if they were successful and poached, he knew who the next manager was going to be. If they weren't successful, he still knew. So he would always have his, his finger on the pulse of who was doing well, who wasn't doing well, and he would appoint the right manager most of the time. Yeah. You know? So it was it was just a it was just a great time to be at a great club with great people. And I go that goes from Stuart Duff to well, the chairman at the top to Stuart Duff all the way down every single person. The groundsman Jimmy was brilliant. Loved Jimmy to bits. With Bruce at the door for all the years Still there. he's been there. Still Character, there. absolutely. McNutt, the office staff, the, the catering staff, the chef, and more importantly, Aggie. Aggie was a character. Mm-hmm. So you you knew when you walked in if Aggie was talking to you or not, and she would swear at you, she would shout at you, but she, she had a heart of gold, Aggie. You know, really yeah. really good person. Jockey Peebles, Arthur Henderson, all these people at the club. Did you speak to Alan Kermahan who came to? You know, Middlesbrough, Man City, and all the rest of it. Happiest time of his career at mm-hmm. St Johnston. Paul Kane, happiest time of his career at St Johnston. And that that goes with a lot of the guys at that time because of the team spirit, because of the camaraderie that we had, and we would we would we would battle for each other as well. And, and I see a lot of that in St Johnston's team ever since we've left. It's it carries on. I don't know how they do it. As I said earlier, it continues to carry on, and, it's, and long may it continue. Brilliant. It's a, it's, a, it's a good club. It's a brilliant club, Dan Sam, honestly. It's a great club. I love my time there. I love going back there. It's, it's a brilliant club. Appreciate Perfect, that. Sam. Catch you on, buddy. Thanks, Dan. Cheers, yeah. Dan. Cheers, Dan. Wow, well, there's a few people that didn't come out of that interview very well, Dan. Yeah. What a character, though. A real good laugh doing that. Yeah, that's exactly what you want from an ex-footballer. Just the stories about what happens behind the scenes, especially at St. Johnston. Poor Paul Sturrock having to deal with dog food at his door as well. <laughs> But I mean, it shows, it shows a good atmosphere and yeah, yeah, another guy who's come on so and spoke so warmly about St. Johnston. Which we've been very lucky to do. It's, it's made getting guests very easy when all the participants are more than willing to come on and chat about their time with the club. But we'll move on to our story about knitting. You stay tuned. We it's, did. A, it's a thriller. It's a, I mean, on the surface of it, as you've just described it, you might think, what the hell's going on? But we were talking to Chris Miller a few weeks ago, and we are talking about superstitions, and then we had a little bit of a chat about our superstitions. We've had a message in from Andy McDuff, uh, one of our show, nice fella, and he's uh, come to us with a superstition that his sister had in the run-up to the 2014 Cup final. So in the run-in to the final, as you may have guessed, Andy's sister started knitting. By the time that Saints reached the final, she couldn't bring herself to pack it in, obviously, so it was a bit of a lucky omen. Anyway, this didn't just stop at home. She knitted all the way to Glasgow on the bus <laughs> to the to game. Parkhead. And you might think, well, the needles will get left on the bus. Maybe a nice distraction on the way home if things hadn't gone to plan. No, the knitting paraphernalia went with it into Parkhead. And then as soon as the game kicked off, knitting came out. And <laughs> yeah, she just happily went on a merry way throughout the game. I've just thought of something there. How did you get knitting needles into a football ground? I don't know, because I can't even get a, a bottle of cola with a lid on it. <laughs> so it obviously had the effect, so I'm okay with that lapse in security. Yeah, well, but we're more than happy with that. But- anyway, the story, it was obviously a lucky omen, because it ended in glory. So do you know what? This year, she started it again. <laughs> she started the run up to the League Cup final. Obviously, didn't uh, unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to take in take the knitting roadshow into Hamden. <laughs> but all all through the games to the final, Andy's sister was knitting away and obviously provided a bit of a lucky omen. So a message to Andy's sister and Andy, if you can, she can do that again from the first game of next season. We'll be league champions by twenty points, and you'll have a two and a half mile long scarf by the end of it, <laughs> and scarves for the whole of Perth. What if we could find out if uh, we follow up on that one? Did it say what she was knitting? It doesn't. No. Uh, so, Andy, if you can get in touch with us, you can get in the fault. You can get another mention next week. Yeah. So, yeah, I can touch. We'd love to know. Was it hats, gloves, scarves? Could she do the whole kit and caboodle for all the dogger boys? If you want to knit a couple of dogger saint scarves, we would quite happily model them. So, due to current travel restrictions, we had to put doggers on tour on ice last week, but we are back. We have got our passports and we are off to Denmark, mainly so we can play this. Everybody sing the song, do da, do da. Well, everybody sing the song all the do da day. The cartoons, Dan, mind that one. Uh, I mean, it took me right back to the late 90s that when, you know, that was a thing. 
That was a thing. It actually takes me back to the dogger on a Saturday night with when one certain member, we won't name any names, likes to pull one out, that one out the bag when he's had a few drinks. He does indeed. <laughs> he knows who he is. <laughs> he's well aware of who he is. But with the land of bacon and Peter Schmeichel, <laughs> that's all I've got, top of my head. <laughs> we're, we're in Denmark. Yeah, and speaking of the combination of those two things, did you ever see um, the Peter Schmeichel Dame Pack advert? No, I did not. Are you not? Oh, he sings a song and everything. <laughs> we usually kind of plan a script of what we're going to talk about. This was not on the script, but I'm very intrigued about what this is. I'm going to have to Google it. know what people want. There's no better bacon. <laughs> <laughs> the sad thing is I won't repeat it. I know every lyric to it. Well, uh, end of season special. <laughs> if the people want you to sing the whole bacon advert, it'll have to happen. Yeah, I nearly moved to Denmark, you know. What? I nearly moved to Denmark about five or six years ago. Okay, tell me more. Well, I was um, looking at doing my master's and I applied to, because it's free education over there, even if you're an international student. I was applying for Allborg. You might have heard of the football team. I have, yep. So they got a university there and it was only an administrative error that stopped me from going. Wow. I was set to go. And then by the time I sort of thought about it and I was like, oh yeah, it's free education, but it's 25 quid for a block of cheese. <laughs> so I mean, I came back and ended up getting a scholarship back at Dundee. Well, for part of my fees, did my master's there and lived like a king for four quid a week. So yeah, it could have been all very different. Wouldn't have been doing this. You could buy, you could buy a lot of cheese in Dundee for 25 quid. <laughs> yeah, could have. Wouldn't, have been, wouldn't have been doing this podcast. Wouldn't have met you. Well, it all worked yeah. out perfectly well. The administrative error, was it Keir McInnesby in charge of it? And he just couldn't remember your name. That's what it was. Yeah, it could it could well have been. So, anyway. But instead, I'm sat here uh, getting excited about the day a bowling club reopened. So, yeah, it it's panned- all worked out. <laughs> all no, no, no regrets. No regrets. All bad do well. But we are in Denmark and we are discussing one half of two famous brothers, probably the lesser famous of the two, I would have to say. Tommy Lovinkranz is who we're talking about today. Yep. I mean, I'll... I'll Leave you to take this up, Sam. But for me, he was always a bit of a mixed bag of a footballer. He was a funny one because he played as a trialist. I want to say it was Roddy Grant's testimonial. He played as a trialist and a, he scored one and he had a game of his life. The fans were chanting, there's only one trialist. And on the back of that, he signed and he wasn't that great. No, I sort of got the wrong brother there. Yeah, Tommy, on the other hand, um, no, sorry, Peter Lovenkranz, on the other hand, was a, a bit of a star for Rangers. But Tommy did have his moments. He scored a couple of absolute screamers, if I remember, at Tynecastle. One of them, like a thunderbolt off the underside of the crossbar. One of the probably decent away goals that I've seen in my time. But yeah, he joined the club, played a couple of seasons. We got relegated in the team he was in. Couldn't offer him a new deal and... Off he popped back from whence he came. Yeah, it was a bit of a tale of um, tale of two brothers. We had. See, I have or often have hipster opinions on brother. For example, Phil was better than Gary. But <laughs> oh. yeah, it was unfortunate timing for Tommy because the end of that season, you know, where he it coincided where he was getting relegated with Saints, his brother was slapping in a last minute winner in an old firm Derby Cup final. So yeah, it. You, you can't just compare people to to the brothers. I mean, I can't pick between you and Kev, mate. But. I'm doing a podcast with you and he's doing pub quizzes with Ainsley Harriet. That's how the other half live. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what he'll be thinking. You're the lucky one here, boy. <laughs> there was also like rumours that he was pumping Jackie Bird. <sighs> lucky bastard. <laughs> we can't like- confirm or deny. We'll just throw it out there. That's what we heard. He was allegedly a lucky bastard. <laughs> Fair play, Mr. Lovenkranz. Yeah, so whatever you did on the pitch, Tommy, was allegedly outshone by what allegedly you did off it. <laughs> and for that... The word alleged, we'll have to shoehorn this in a few times and put a wee disclaimer at the end. But if you've got any yeah. memories of Mr. Lovenkranz for St. Johnston, let us know and we'll include it in our follow-up section next week. But we've not really much we can say about him. It's probably the best trialist we've ever seen up last. Because obviously it was a big crowd that night. Saints were playing Coventry City. <laughs> 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 what a bunch oh, they, they, they never let us down you can't escape him he scored one I think he assisted one but he was an absolute trailblazer that night had probably one of the best debut trialist games I've ever seen because sometimes you see players in pre-season games they're okay but Tommy Lovenkrantz had an absolute blinder we got him signed up and it kind of coincided with a poor Saints team at the time but yeah, yeah. I mean, was- it would have been a good Coventry side as well 
if I remember correctly, around that time, I mean, they, Robbie Keane was still there. I think that was just before he went to Inter Milan. Um, Hassan Kashlul, guys like that. Um, was it Mustafa Al Hadji they had? Yeah, yep, he was there. Yeah, he was a good player, Darren Huckabee. A uh, decent lineup. So, but Tommy Lovingkrans, thanks for thanks for your efforts, but we would have preferred your brother. So once again, we have got another superstar guest lined up, Dan. There are not many men, Sam, who can claim to have made more than 300 appearances for St. Johnston. It is not. Well, oh, and with that, a few hundred appearances for Hibs beforehand. Oft. Now you've gained my interest. International appearances for Canada. Go on. And a sublime first touch. Ooh. It is my pleasure and honour to welcome our special guest this week to the Dog of Saints podcast. It's David Wotherspoon. It's brother, Ian. Ian, hello. How are you doing? You all right? <laughs> hey. Evening, right, gentlemen. Well, like, mate, you all right? I'm good. How are you? Very, very well. Thanks for coming to join us. You join the illustrious family members of you and Jason Kerr's mum, Tracy. That, that's it so far. Oh, she was excellent last week. She was good. So, yeah. You're, you're not wearing a Saint scarf or got a flag in the background, but that's okay, Ian. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> just so, just, just, just uh, back in my office, my home office. I'll, I'll give you that. It's a professional setup and a professional surroundings you've got there. So, we'll, we'll talk about the cup final. You're a very proud brother, I presume. Proud, yes. Yes, of course. Goes without saying, to be honest. Um, it's kind of <clears throat> not cliche. I'm not going to bum them up too much, but you know, you're, the younger brother's meant to look up to the older brother. But in terms of this case, it's probably me looking up to him more the way more the way he goes about his business, you know. But yeah, the League Cup final was absolutely incredible. Just glad we weren't there like we were in 2014 for the Scottish uh, Cup. Um, so yeah, but no, it was what, what an amazing achievement. So have you managed to speak to David this week? Uh, yeah, I've, I've spoke. Um, not necessarily different. WhatsApp's more the conversational uh, chat these days, uh, just sending WhatsApp back and forth. Uh, plenty of emojis here and there. But um, yeah, no, I've, I've speak to him regularly on WhatsApp. Uh, I've seen him in the build up to the final and spoke to him a few times. Um, but yeah, just he's emotional. You know, we were emotional watching him. Thought it might be a bit easier after, you know, we've already watched him on a cup before, I've seen how they've done it, but it's <laughs> just as emotional the second time round as it is the first. So. Is, is it sunk in, yeah, that he's the most decorated player in St. Johnston history? <laughs> Not really, no. I don't think it will until until it's finished. I don't think it will until we look back on it in a few years' time. Um, you know, and even then, he's got another two years now. So his appearances are should hopefully, fingers crossed, touch wood, that you know all goes well. Yeah, you know, you make more appearances, climb up that all-time leaderboard, and then you know, five, ten years' time, you know, when my son's grown up a bit and you'll be able to go and tell him all about it. And then if I have grandkids or whatever, to explain them how big an achievement it actually is. You know, this is probably the most, su- most successful decade of, in the club's history. And it's fantastic watching so many even younger players, a few local boys, you know, Stevie May, um, you know, Liam Gordon, these guys as well. They all know what it's about to be part of the club. And I think that makes a massive difference. What else you want to cover, Dan? I already know the answer to this, Ian, but just for everyone else out there. I mean, so we were chatting night before the final. I asked how you were, um, how you were feeling, and I think, put it politely, nervous. <laughs> yes, definitely. You know, always, always, oh, you always are. Um, even when just being a Saints fan, you're nervous before like a semi final or a big game. You know, going to it, you always feel the build up. But you know, it, it, it's hard to explain the other pressure you feel when your younger sibling is involved in the biggest game. The pressure on him, you want him to do well. You know, when he was at Hibs, when he was playing, obviously I got nervous for him in certain certain games like if they're going to play Hearts or something a big derby he's going to be on the telly and you, you feel that but it, you feel the nerves for him but to be honest I was more hoping he would play well but I couldn't give a rat's ass how Hibs got on but that's just me being a Saints fan so I wasn't you know, as long as yeah. he played well I wasn't bothered whereas now obviously I want him to do well but ultimately I want Saints to win as well so it's kind of the the, the balance between the two but yeah before the cup final is yeah it, w- it wasn't a great night's sleep to be honest I can only imagine how he was feeling and especially that you couldn't get to the game and get pies and bovril and free goodies at half time like you usually do at McDermott you freeloader yeah I can't I can't sponge off it the, the, <laughs> the Hamden hospitality wouldn't you know would, would, was, wasn't there uh, this time uh, but funnily enough at the, the Scottish Cup final wasn't it I didn't go to hospitality for that we got a family bus through you know cousins aunties uncles granddads friends of the family all these kind of everybody on a bus and went through to Hamden for the for the 2014 final and it was what a fantastic day that was just the build up with the family and being able to spend it with them and MC you know David ultimately left the cup after two cup disappointments with Hibs um, and then to me see me see, me see him 
lift the cup, but also St Johnson lift their made, first major trophy. That was, an, that was an incredible day. So this year was strange because we didn't normally. That's what we would have done. That's what we would have. I say normally, like it happens all the time. You know, we'd be getting the, the family together, getting on a bus and going through to mark the occasion. But we all had to do it from home. But we had a few Zoom chats later on with the family and and speak to them. So everybody is absolutely delighted for. Them. Brilliant. Uh, we'll finish up. It's form this season has been colossal at best. It's probably been his best season by a. I would say most consistent season, I think, would probably be fair. Do you know what yeah, what, what, yeah. Would that, what would that be down to? I think it's a mixture of things. Um, I think he just seems he seems pretty settled because I think the way Callum Davidson has uh, plays, and this is no obviously no criticism of Tommy Wright whatsoever. He played differently. David's one of these players that he's got football and brain on him, so he could say, right, you could play almost anywhere on the pitch, um, yeah. apart from in goals, I would suggest he'd give it a good bash. Um, so Tommy Wright would chop and change things. They like to tinker quite a lot. He would do, you know, David would get left midfield one week, right the next centre, and, you know, give nothing but 100% all the time. But with the way Callum plays, he's kind of fixed. He's either out on the left or just in behind the striker, but he's high up the pitch. Yeah. And that's where he wants to be because he gets more of the ball. He's getting it at his feet. He's he's allowed a bit more freedom, creative license, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that they're trying to play, they're trying to keep the ball on the deck. And I really like watching them this season. And they've been very unlucky not to be higher up the table, um, taking more points. Um, I just think sometimes David maybe needs to be a bit more greedy. Maybe he's a bit too honest because he's too much of a team player. That's just my opinion from watching him over the years. I just think he needs to be a bit more greedy, shoot a bit more. He might get, uh, get a few more goals to his tally. But I think generally it's been settled, playing in a certain position and a bit of creative license and I think he just seems to be quite comfortable He's, as you say consistency this year has been, been fantastic Brilliant Dan? Yeah just to actually expand on that theme really because as you were saying he's in previous seasons he's played here and there and different positions it now sort of also is at the state when you're a bit younger it's probably more you know players are more willing to yeah. Bearing different positions and all that. But he's probably at the stage of his career where he was ready to just settle into a, have that one set position and really make it his own. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. it was, um, even goes back to when he was at, at Hibs, when he first came on the scene, he, he's a right midfielder. And he kind of, he came onto the scene there and he kind of got thrown in uh, the deep end under John Hughes, gave him his chance and he, he, he started really well. And ultimately, young players have a dip in form. He had a dip in form. He came back, started playing and then the next thing, he got put to right back because they struggled. They didn't have enough players and he got put out position. He had two or three really good games at right back. So John Hughes decided, oh yeah, you'll just play at right back then. And he had a couple of good games and then I think it was Rangers away. Um, I can't imagine his manager at the time for Rangers, but Rangers away. And I think they basically they seen that. So Rangers just put Kyle Lafferty on him. So this is an 18-year-old right midfielder played at right back with Kyle Lafferty on him. And they just launched the ball up to him. And he couldn't get near him. He couldn't, they just, that was their own ball. So he struggled. He had a poor game. You know, he's out. It wasn't, you know, not, not so much his fault, but he had a poor game that game. And Rangers kind of sorted that out. And after that, he lost a bit of confidence. But again, I think it goes down to the positioning. He can play it. He could generally, I believe, play anywhere. His left foot's not as good as mine right enough, but um, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, he could he could generally give it a bash and play anywhere. And I think sometimes, as much as that's a good thing, it could also be a flaw, and it can be a bit of a problem in terms of trying to get build a bit of consistency um, in a certain in a certain position and uh, build up your confidence in your form. Brilliant, really, and I appreciate you coming on. It's been an absolute treat having you talk about David, and hopefully, we'll see you again very soon. Thanks for having me on, guys. Keep up the good work. Loving the, the podcasts. Oh, get up. A bloody good guy, eh? Oh, what, what a guy. Now, Dan, I'm not saying that our, our family member guests are better than our Saints guests, but they're pretty good. They are very good. That was a good interview, that with Ian there. We must move on. And so Callum Davidson's came out in the press this week talking about how the loan system has worked wonders for the current crop of young St. Johnson players progressing through the squad. Players like Ali McCann, Jason Kerr, Gordon, Clark, Kane, May have all benefited from playing football at lower league levels. Seems to work for us. It does. Uh, it's provided a whole crop of the, the squad at the minute, really, the core of the squad. And yeah, I mean, it's great for great for young players to get out there, as long as you know they're going to play. It's the last thing you need. And admittedly, Saints are a little bit guilty of this, of yeah. bringing in lone players to sort of pad the bench. But... For the, for the kids, if they go, uh, I mean, Jason Kerry was a, did a couple of seasons at East Fife, uh, did, and him and Chris Kane were together at uh, Queen of South for half a season. Ali McCann played a few games for Stram Ra and then was immediately into the into the first team. And sorry, immediately... where, where where Dan? Stram Ra. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> we have to shoot oh, harder than at least two Phoenix Knight references on every episode. And we were one shot. <laughs> oh, there he is. Ali Stramrat McCann. <laughs> so, so he was at Stramrat. Stramrat. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and then immediately comes in and was last season, it was our best player last season. I don't think there can be any debate about that. Nope. Or not too much anyway. So yeah, it's a great, it's a great way. And it, it's got to be mutually beneficial. Because we're saying this when Callum Hendry, which is admittedly a bit of a different situation, but when Callum Hendry went out to Aberdeen, you know, you, you're just in a hope that it's mutually beneficial for all parties. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and there's plenty of talented youngsters out there. There's no substitute for the experience of game time. And also, when you down go down the levels, I'm not saying the, um, the Premiership some sort of cakewalk in terms of the physical side of things, but... When you get down into the semi-pro levels and, and stuff like that, you know, it can toughen you up a little bit. Yeah, you kind of need that in your system. You do need match experience with, from them levels. And yeah, so I feel a wee bit sorry for players like your Ollie Hamilton, Ballantyne, Wells, Ferguson, Robertson, players like that who aren't getting the match experience they, they kind of need at the moment or would have had if the leagues were to still carrying on as pair. Yeah, and it's hopefully they're all still sort of young enough that you know, next season, hopefully things are looking a lot better and they can get out and get a full season somewhere in the lower reaches. Uh, so, uh, because it is so important to say, so you see, as we say, with a core of the side at the minute, when you're working on limited financial resources, that if you get a group of lads coming through from the youth system, it's it's absolutely brilliant. We're ready to play football. We're ready, raring to go. And it's got to be a conveyor belt because, look, nobody's, nobody's thick here. There's some damn good players in that first team at the minute who will attract attention. Thinking of Kerr, McCann, Rooney, guys like that, who will, you know, regard, <laughs> be honest, they might not be at Saints forever. Just just let me nip in there. Um, we talked previously about Rooney getting a Scotland call-up. Now, there's now massive kind of rumblings about getting Jason Kerr back. And I know there was talk a couple of years ago that he was the best player by a country mile. Barnsley may have came in for a million pound bid for him. I didn't say he went off the boil, but he's certainly playing the best football of his Saints career at the moment. Has he got an outside chance of a call-up? I certainly think he has. I would be... Again, I said this at the time with Rooney, it's quite easy when you when you support a club and you watch a player week in, week out to say, ah, oh, you know, he's he should be in there. He should be in the international side. But with... With Kerr, again, I just think it'd work. I, the same, I, I don't want to repeat the same arguments I made about Rooney last week or a couple of weeks back, but they play in that system. They know what it's all about. And you, you look at what Clark's been doing as well. He's had Declan Gallagher in there, who's, been, who's done great. That's fine. But he's also had Kieran Tierney and Scott McTominay in there, and neither of whom are centre-halves. I think Tierney would carry on there, but you look at McTominay, really, you're going to want him moving into midfield. He's been a he's, he's done a good job back there, and it's worked. But really, going forward, you're probably wasting a player. Best who's, did further up the player park. Player that ability. And again, you're not, there's not many jumping out. I certainly think with Kerr, it'd be worth putting him in the squad and, and having a look in close quarters. For Steve Clark to have a look in close quarters, even if he doesn't uh, play either of the games even if he gets in the squad and doesn't play it'd be good for Clark to have a look at him see how he operates in training and all that and again he's a leader he's a he's a proper leader and you need as many as you can in the side but that shows you the hallmarks of the Saints loan system the fact that players like Kerr are being called into the Scotland squad based on the fact that they've kind of learned their trades in the lower leagues now the current crop as you said do you think many of them are going to make the breakthrough? well I think they'll get as good a chance as they can I mean not everyone makes the breakthrough and you just hope that if they don't make a breakthrough in the at the top level uh, in Scottish football, that they'll have a career elsewhere, they'll filter down and have a good career, maybe build it up from there again, because, I mean, that can happen. It, but they're certainly a talented bunch. And as I say, hopefully the, the bulk of the side that we've got at the minute stays together next season. So the guys like Hamilton and Ballantyne and all the guys you mentioned can get out there and get playing in the lower leagues. But I mean, the thing I'm most looking forward to is if they do, a bunch of them do make the grade. I mean, what a set of names they've got. <laughs> I mean, you've got two proper football names there in John Robertson and Alex Ferguson. <laughs> and then Jack Wills. A fashion icon. Fashion icon. Yeah, we're bringing in like, you know, them... Then rugby shirts with the different coloured sleeves and stuff like that. You know, they'll be well decked out, the boys. So I think that'd be really beneficial. All we need to do is sign an Abercrombie and a Fitch, and then we've got the full lineup there. For some reason, Dan, this is still our most popular feature by a country mile. I don't know why. It's good. It, everybody can take part. All they need to do. Yeah, is- it's good. 
Everybody, all they need to do is see an ex St. Johnson player or current St. Johnson player inning around someplace that isn't McDermott and isn't Murray Davidson just walking to work every day. So the first two names in this week came through our Facebook page and this chap said he's seen Gregory Taddy and Nigel Hasselbank in Boots in Perth. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, they, they need yeah. their cosmetic. Gregory Taddy, if you ever see him, if you follow him on Instagram, he does a lot of live videos with facial products. A lot of them. Like skin, yeah. skincare regime. Times are hard, aren't they? But the guy went on to say that he said he's seen them buying Vaseline. I'm not overly convinced of that, but there you go. Taddy and Hasselbank in boots. Craig Murray, also on Facebook, seen Michael Howard in Ballantyne's The Gym in Steps. That couldn't have been recently, I presume. No, no, that would have been a while back now. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, the one thing I only ever think of with Steps now, a few Saints fans might know what I'm on about, is the Battle of Steps, which I've heard of in numerous sources. That H versus Clear. <laughs> What a reference! That. Is anyone anyone younger than us will just be tuning off now. I'm sorry. It seems to be like a, a theme running through every podcast. Last week or the week before was Sunday League football. This week it seems to be '90s, late '90s references. Yeah, that is pop culture. It must have been that Twitter poll got to us. That's what it was. So, yeah, that would be our. Thought. So you aren't referring to the better, best, forgotten in five, six, seven, eight pop classics. <laughs> no, it's a tragedy, Sam. <laughs> So is that joke? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the what was the Battle of Steps? I'll sit back. I'll grab a beer. Right. Um, Teach me. I've heard this from a few sources. Sources whose names I won't mention, but there's a chippy in Step. And me and I used to play Air United quite often. Yeah. Sort of in the 90s. And apparently there was just one almighty tear up at this chippy in Steps. And I, I shouldn't want to get it. One with Air fans because they have been nowhere near it. I don't know what it was. I, I can't remember who it was who it was against or whatever, but there was just like busloads of folk getting into an absolute scrape at this chippy in steps. Like the scene from Anchorman where just like the Spanish announced team coming and just with nunchucks and uh, just like that, all the team's buses start rolling up. That'd be great. Tim Robbins plays PBS public <laughs> news. <laughs> but yeah, those steps only reminds me of um, the old bit you have to drive through before the new motorway and that, kids. Let's go back to the 90s again. Uh, when you had to drive towards Glasgow, you had to go through steps and there was the, the roundabout which looked like Madonna's tits, like the bra, the coat, the kind of pointy, <laughs> the pointy roundabout. We managed to drag out a little feature about, you know, Michael Halloran. If the gym was, maybe he was there when the gym was shut. Maybe he was like robbing it. Could have been. We can't rule it out. He was out injured a couple of times. Maybe he was hitting the face by a couple of paint tins. Maybe there was like a young boy looking after the gym. <laughs> Stop with the 90s references. <laughs> <laughs> but to... <laughs> We need, we've got to end up overcompensating next week and doing the old, how are you doing, fellow kids? <laughs> uh, do you like the PlayStation? I like the PlayStation. Our last one of the week, uh, John O'Neill was spotted playing for Wishaw over 35s. See, I'm, I'm not growing all that gracefully, to be honest with you. But one thing I'm quite looking forward to is being able to qualify for over 35s. Yes. See, when you're over 35 like myself, Dan, it doesn't just turn into walking football. Well, some team might have made. They might be desperate for numbers because <laughs> so folk kids and stuff like that, aren't they? So, how, how old's Alan McGregor? About 38 or something. He's doing all right for himself. Goalkeeper, isn't he? He doesn't really have to do anything. We ask you again, please send in where you've seen St. Johnston players out and about. Dan? Yeah. What we want to know is St. Johnston players, where you seen them? Let us know. Have you ever seen Rowan Vine down the local cyber cafe yearning for the return of lost, long lost e-video site Vine? <laughs> oh, have you ever seen Stevie Banks catching the train to Dundee on a Friday night, looking right tarty and smart ahead of a blockbuster night at the Mecca Bingo? <laughs> it's happened. So have you seen it? You let us know. There were some games this weekend. Livy have secured top six with a victory over Hamilton. One spot up for grabs between the Battle of the Saints. Will it be St. Johnson or St. Mirren? We must better their result. We have to win against Ross County. Yeah, well, I was quite disappointed that Aki's uh, decided not to be at it again this weekend because, I mean, the thing about Martindale is I'm convinced he's just a top hat away from playing the fat controller from Thomas the Tank Engine in some really ropey stage version. And <laughs> could be doing without that in the top six. First and foremost, we need to beat Ross County, will we? I think we will. That concludes that section. <laughs> yep, there we go. Well done. Good podcasting again, Sam. <laughs> that is it. That reminds me of the time that uh, I was in Tesco. I don't think I told you about this, Dan. We were wandering around getting some beer before an away trip and we got called into the, the, you know, the food tasting bit at the back of the Tesco in the Creef Road, asking us yeah. to try some cake. <laughs> and um, 
So we're all sitting. I bet you had your hand up for that. Oh, do you want some free cake, lads? Yes. So we're sitting down there. We're tasting a, a variety of them, and we had to mark them out of ten and write comments on it, like, "Oh, it was really moist and delicious." And so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dan, I know I've just seen you screw up your face with that word. Was it cake? Was that the word? Was it? We're marking down, writing paragraphs of stuff about all these cakes, and I look around at my mate who's just written, "Good cake." <laughs> 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 I like it. I, I feel that's all you need. Was it good cake? It, it, it was a delicious cake, so he wasn't far off the mark with it, but I don't think he's going to be in a podcast anytime soon. But how was the Saints game? I'll get him on. He sounds like my kind of guest. How was Ross County? Bad. How was St. Johnson? Bad. Good. But so, sorry, sorry to interrupt with chat of Tesco and cake. So No, I enjoyed that. Uh, back to the football. We managed to avoid talking about football that much for sort of most of this episode. But yeah, uh, it's a. I mean, there's two fixtures going on that are pivotal to to Saints. Uh, well, they've probably got more importance at the bottom of the table because the the way it is, the way the sort of the tail of the tape is, we need a win and we need Saint Mirren to lose. I think there can be some shenanigans with a draw. St. Mary and Joe and Saints win by a certain number of goals. I think two two goals or more. Yeah. I, but obviously we're playing County and St. Mary and are playing Ackies. So it's going to be a bit, I think there could be a couple of good tear-ups. To be honest with you, as we've said for a couple of weeks, so this is now becoming sort of a secondary sort of interest out of these games. Because really it is about who who can get three points on the board with relegation. From the Saints' perspective, we do want to finish top six. We want to finish as high up as we can. I think one of the aspects for that finishing top six is you're guaranteed you're not getting relegated and contract negotiations might be able to get pressed on. I don't think we're going to go down anyway, but it just gives you that peace of mind. It gives you a peace of mind. Yeah, like you say, you can start on the work for next season a little bit earlier. And just, uh, and as we said, the guys are professionals. They want to finish as high up the table as they can. It'd be another feather in the cap, but not yet another top six finish. So I think we'll beat County because I think we're a better side than County. Well, in fact, I'm going to rephrase that. We're a better side than County. So I think we'll beat them. Aki's against St. Mirren. Well, we say Aki's are at it, but uh, they've not won in five. Three draws and two defeats. I'm sort of writing. I'm sort of writing Killy off by proxy here, but considering they've all got to play each other again in the bottom six, that's kind of that's kind of the reason for the split. Make sure these teams all get a, a crack of the whip against each other. Yeah, I think for County, look, nothing's going to get decided with regards to relegation next week. County have three points on Aki's. I mean, six points could be a big. It's going to be six points or no points. So they are bigger games for those two teams than they are for either of the Saints, but. We'll just see how it goes and it'll keep things interesting. In terms of the lineup, again, the Saints team pretty much picks itself and they've all had a week off. You say it picks itself. I uh, know Callum Davidson tinkers with the squad, a couple, a couple of players every game. Uh, I don't know if uh, we've ever played the same team twice. Uh, I'm not big on stats. That's not my scene. Who knows what your team out. Michael Halloran might play that right wing back position again if Rooney isn't back yet. Liam Craig yeah. has been excellent. Whether it's been all played, but yeah, like two up top or one up top. That's that's all we can really talk about formation wise. Eh? You'd think Melamed and Kane. Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see whether Rooney's back. That is really the only point of interest in sort of team selection. We're not doing a particularly good job of bigging this up, really. But I would imagine it, if fans could get there. I think there'd be more excitement. Yeah. Oh, it'd be a good day because it always is when something's on the line. Yep. We'd have a we'd have a decent crowd in, plenty of, we'd have a good we'd have a good day, but and a bit of excitement a lot. At the end of the day, we are we've done very, very well, given where we were at the turn of the year, to get in this position. The season will not be defined on whether we get top six or bottom six. No, the season was defined on the twenty eighth of February. Correct. Yeah. But it would be nice to get up there. But either way, I don't think it will be remembered for finishing in the top six or finishing in the bottom six. Whichever side of the split we finish on, we're probably going to be looking towards the middle, mid-table anyway. I think if we do get top six, though, I think it will probably give players like Kerr and Rooney a bigger crack of the whip to get into the Scotland team. Yes, I agree with that. So that's a massive bumper episode all finished again for another week, Dan. Oh, it's incredible that we've managed to <laughs> eke out a bumper episode like that, despite there not being a game of football this weekend. Our thanks, Alan Preston, to help helping us out with that one. Yeah, that was a good, good fun.
could have listened to them for a while. Uh, this part of the podcast, we like to just do a couple of announcements. You may have seen in the front page of the PA about a Saints fan called Gary Mitchell, who had a baby the day after the cup final with his partner, Louise. So congratulations to them. We I've known Gary for a long time. His dad's a, a dog, a regular, as you all know, Dan. Yeah, yeah, big, uh, big congratulations to Gary, Louise and all the family. And especially to Gary, not just on the birth of a uh, little baby Lottie, but on a truly fantastic beard. Oh, I've not seen Gary in probably about a year, and I don't think he shaved in that time, but it's a triumphant beard. No. It's triumphant. It's triumphant. It's a, that is the correct word. The great beard. Well, well, if you can Google it and try and find a picture of Gary Mitchell and his beard, it's, it's, it's a sight to behold. But no, congratulations to him and baby Lottie May. He was going. He was in the papers talking about how if it was a boy, he was going to call it Sean Rooney, and if it was a girl, he was going to call it Sean Rooney. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which tickled me I think Louise, Louise might have stepped in there on, yeah. on either of them but nah big congratulations to Gary and the family yeah and, and and granddad Sandy Mitchell who's a good Saints story about him was we were going to the remember when Saints played Hearts at uh, Murrayfield I know exactly this story because I was on this trip <laughs> so we're all in the pub the pub's opened at 9 o'clock in the morning we're all in the pub uh, Sandy's there first getting every drinks and we're all having drinks before we get in the bus. We're on the bus and we're on the way through and I'm, I'm looking around and went, said to my dad, where's Sandy? Where's Sandy Mitchell? And he went, he's not coming. I mean, what do you mean? He was in the pub and he went, yeah, he just heard the pub was opening at night so he thought, <laughs> he, he thought he'd come in. I was nearly charging down the aisle of the bus to tell the driver to stop. <laughs> I'm looking like Sand- Sandy's outside the pub. Like, I've left him. Do we need to say hi to Billy Ingalls as well this week, Dan? Do you know why? Why do we need to do this, Sam? Well, he's listening in Melbourne, I'll show you. Unbelievable scenes here. We've gone global, baby. We have gone. On gl- yourself, Billy. We have indeed gone global. So thanks for listening in Melbourne. But that made me looking at the stats of the pod, which stats aren't my scene. I have had a look on where people have listened to the podcast. And do you want a rundown? Yeah, let's have a run. I know we've got a couple in Canada. We have indeed, Mr. Dazovic. Thank you very much. United States, Ireland, Australia, Spain, Germany, Hong Kong, Czech Republic, New Zealand, United Arab Emirates, Sweden, Belgium, Israel, Thailand, Austria, Romania, China, Finland, Poland, Norway, and South Korea. Genuinely. Incredible. Do you reckon the Swedish um, sort of got on the back of it after my spot on Swedish accent a couple of weeks ago? That's what, it, that's what it was. They thought, this guy, we'll, we should get him on board for our tourist campaign, our Scottish branch. He, he can talk the lingo. But, but all seriously, that is an incredible list of countries where people have listened to the podcast. Uh, we've been incredibly lucky to have people, even 100 people listen to the podcast, let alone 10,000, which, which we're almost at now. It's, it's just yet another thing that's completely taken me aback about doing this and how people have responded. So thank you so much to everyone, whether you're listening in Hunting Tower or Hobart. <laughs> <laughs> so no it's just it's absolutely incredible and thank you so much to everyone who's listening someone like dan whose family lived in south he's not seen them in a year this just gives us a little bit of focus for the week and gives us something to look forward to and we, we're not doing it for self-indulgence we're doing it for you guys to get you through lockdown and long may this continue for a long time coming so we will see you next monday yep so long everyone you go make this week your bitch and we'll see you next monday <laughs> bye-bye <laughs>